boy, we've got an interesting topic on deck tonight, Life Between Lives. And my guest this evening is going to be Richard Martini. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. You know, a conversation about dreams like we had last night with Dr. Delaney is this is sort of a natural progression, right? To go from dreams into life between lives, I think. It is a natural progression, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. I um, did some reading on the subject earlier and in the past few days, and it turns out this is this is an entire phenomenon. This is There is an entire world out there between lives, and so I'm very curious about it. And look forward to the conversation. Richard Martini will be joining us after the bottom of the hour break at the usual time. But we do have some news to go over first and uh, possibly take a couple of phone calls here from all of you out there. And I want to give uh, just another update on what's going on now in Manchester in regard to the horrible attack that took place on Monday. So we now know who the bomber is. Uh, the guy's name is Salman Abedi. And they believe that he was most likely part of a network that might have helped him carry out the bombing that killed 22 people. And it could be planning further assaults. And this comes from British officials just today. Um, Turns out there's an Islamist militia group in Tripoli who said today that they uh, have arrested Mr. Abedi's 20-year-old brother Hashim Hashem uh, at the family's home in the Libyan capital of Tripoli uh, on Tuesday. The brother was arrested, and uh, they say that he was a member of the Islamic State who is planning an attack on Tripoli as well. Uh, And a quote from Ahmed Amran, who is a spokesperson for this militia, known in Tripoli as the Special Deterrence Force, said that we have been following him for at least a month and a half now. And later, Mr. Amrad said that the group was holding the father as well, Ramadan Abedi. And uh, the Special Deterrence Force, or RADA as it's known, is one of the most powerful militant groups on the streets of Libya, which is pretty lawless out there. Its leaders are staunch Islamists, and it operates a detention facility, an actual detention facility out there where many people suspected of being Islamic State fighters are being held. And Mr. Amran said that Hashem Abedi told the militia that he had been kept in the loop about the attack in Manchester by his brother and that the group alleged in a Facebook post that Hashem had been involved in the planning of the bombing, but they had no proof uh, other than the Facebook post. The militia also said that Hashem traveled to Libya from Britain on April 16th and that he had been in daily phone contact with his older brothers since then. And, you know, I got I got to stop right there for just a second because I've been listening to Nigel Farage talk about the attacks in Manchester. And he came up with a rather interesting. Well, I don't know if you would call it a solution, but definitely something to get in the way of people who want to plan these type of attacks to travel uh, from Britain to Libya or Syria and then return to Britain to carry out these horrible attacks. He says, take their passports, take their passports. Uh, Anybody identified as a terrorist in Britain, just take their passports. And, and, And that would be at least one step to take, right? It may not stop those kind of attacks, but it may, I don't know, put a bottleneck on them at the at the least. So the Greater Manchester Police said today uh, that two more people had been arrested, a man and a woman, uh, in connection with the investigation. The man was taken into custody in Warwickshire, according to the police, and the woman was arrested during raids in the Blackley area of Manchester, which is north of the city center, and the police have provided no further details there. And I sure hope they don't. Because it turns out the American media is so hot on this story that they are inadvertently leaking details that they should not be leaking uh, in order for the British authorities to carry out their investigation. So investigators have been focused on determining who may have helped the bomber plan and execute the attack at the Manchester Arena and... uh, A quote from Amber Rood, who's Britain's home secretary, said it seems likely and very possible that he wasn't doing this 
on his own. And Chief Constable Ian Hopkins of the Greater Manchester Police said at a news conference uh, today that this is a network they're investigating. And he did not specify whom the police were looking for. And I sure hope they don't. I would much rather find out after after the fact. Um, so if investigators are searching for a bomb maker, they didn't say. I imagine that they are, though. Um, so he said that there's an extensive investigation going on and activity taking place across Greater Manchester as we speak. Now, four men were arrested today as well, three in Manchester and one in, I hope I pronounced this right, Wigan, a town to the northwest, bringing the total number of people into custody uh, to five, which actually, if I do the math here, I think that's actually seven, seven people uh, in total that have been arrested, including Mr. Abadie's older brother. And what role, if any, they've played in the attack is unclear at this point. I'm sure we'll find out later on. Uh, Images of evidence photographed and collected at the crime scene suggest an IED, an improvised explosive device, made with a lot of thought and a lot of care. Now, the BBC, citing unidentified intelligence sources, reported on Wednesday that officials believed Mr. Abadie had been a mule carrying the bomb made by someone else. And... You know, I had thought that. Um, I don't know what gave me that thought, but it just seemed to me that uh, the bomber, the suicide bomber, was just picked the shortest straw. You know, he was just uh, probably excited to go out and do what he did. Um, You know, deluded as they are. But but I, I just had this feeling that he had been picked by a group of people to go out and actually implement and deploy the attack. So... Our hearts and our thoughts and our prayers are with everybody in the UK, especially in the Manchester area, and especially with officials who are carrying out the investigation. Godspeed to to those officials. Now, there's another smaller disaster that has taken place in California. Uh, uh, You know, over the winter, California kind of got out of their drought, right? Well, that created another problem. In Big Sur, uh, if you don't know where Big Sur is, it's right on the coast. It's it's almost the most beautiful area of California, though there's a lot of beautiful areas there. It's right on the coast, right on cliffs that are uh, facing the ocean. And what happened, what happened there, uh, as a result, one of the bridges on Highway 1 uh, that goes through Big Sur had to be demolished because the ground beneath was just turning into mush. And it effectively turned Big Sur into an island. And a quote from the Washington Post uh, in April was the rain ended California's five-year drought, but it left 45 miles of Highway 1 cut off from the rest of California with very few services for the 450 men, women, and children who live there. What does that mean? Well, that means no mail delivery, a limited supply of gasoline, and one deli, one single deli where you can buy eggs. Even the resident monks have been forced to pass around the modern-day collection plate, known as GoFundMe, to help repair the road leading into their monastery. Now, residents roaming the streets, usually the area is full of tourists, uh, roaming the streets like survivors after an apocalypse. There are no vacationers in Big Sur right now, that's for sure. Kids have been cut off from their schools, and families have had no way of getting any groceries. So what did they have to do? They had to go and actually get out the machetes and bushwhack a one-mile trail that switchbacks and uh, with switchbacks and uh, up steep hills. And students can now hike every morning to the buses that shuttle them into school. Now then, over the weekend, if that isn't bad enough, it got worse. More than a million tons of rock slid down a hillside onto Highway 1, burying a quarter mile up the road in debris. And as of Tuesday, authorities didn't even know what it looked like from the ground because the hillside was so unstable, no one could even get near to approach it and even look at it. And uh, let me see here. Susanna Cruz is a spokesperson with the California Department of Transportation, said, We haven't even been able to go in there and assess Because the mudslide is still moving. They have geologists and engineers who are going to check it out this week to see how they can pick up the pieces. So if you think you're having a bad day out there, think about the people in Big Sur who have access to almost nothing right now. 
So I hope that they get the road repaired. It's going to take quite a while, though. And then, you know, what's going to happen next? The Highway 1, if you don't know, is quite a beautiful but also very precarious highway that is uh, hugs the hills along the California coast. So it is kind of dangerous, but it is also incredibly beautiful. Now, <laughs> I don't know if you would call this a disaster, but it is something awful strange that just happened in Oroville, California, uh, more toward the central California. On May 16th, fish fell from the sky in Oroville, California actually at the Stanford Avenue Elementary School. And uh, a quote uh, from, I think, campus supervisor Liz Gabriel said, we came out and all of a sudden the kids started yelling really loud, look at this, and there were fish all over the place. Apparently, she was the first person to see the fish covering the playground and other areas of the school building, but it appears neither she nor anyone else actually saw the fish fall from the sky. Now, wherever they came from, they were also on the roof, and they sent. Uh, they actually had to send a custodian up to the roof uh, to verify that, and he did. Now, here's kind of this is kind of sad, and it's kind of funny at the same time. Uh, some people actually thought that this was terrorism. I shouldn't laugh. Uh, they thought it was terrorism, or maybe it was just somebody pulling a prank uh, on the school. You know, I just find it kind of just kind of odd that the fish falling from the sky might be confused as terrorism. But a quote from the principal of the elementary school was uh, my first concern was who was on the campus that we didn't know about. But the campus supervisors didn't see any adult uh, out of place and the custodians didn't see anything odd. So we ruled that one out. Now, Oroville is in Butte County, California, borders the Feather River and Lake Oroville recreation areas. So the next logical explanation would be that the fish were brought into the school uh, from one of these bodies of water nearby. Well, the usual explanation for these kind of things is strong winds, uh, storms with water spouts, or fish-eating birds that drop their prey, right, as they're flying. Well, a representative from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife examined the fish and determined that they're carp, which don't even live in the Feather River or in Lake Oroville. And even if they did, a local TV meteorologist pointed out that there were no storms or any other unusual weather that morning. No one saw large flocks of birds flying overhead, and it doesn't appear that the fish were clawed or or half eaten. So does anybody have any idea how in the world something like this might happen? <clears throat> now, I guess it's uh, I guess it's kind of known in the area that uh, years and years ago, they did have a case of trout falling from the sky in Chico. So they thought maybe they came from the fish hatchery. There are fish hatcheries uh, in the area. Well, um, <laughs> Supervisor Liz Gabriel thought that she might win the prize for solving the mystery, uh, but the Feather River hatchery is nearby, but it had no deliveries that could have spilled out from a truck, and no planes flying nearby. The uh, no planes flying nearby. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm holding back my laughter right now. This is such a ridiculous and weird story. I'm <clears throat> All right, we'll carry on here. <clears throat> So anyways, what I was trying to say is there are no planes that came from the fish hatchery and flew over the elementary school. So that's ruled out. The fish didn't fall from a plane either. And uh, even though that fish hatchery, fish hatchery does have carp, um, they still can't figure out how all these fish landed on the school. And nobody saw it with their own eyes. If someone had been outside and saw fish actually falling from the sky with their own eyes, maybe they could point up to the source of it. But, you know, as of now, this is just a mystery. And, of course, boys started picking up some of the fish on the ground and chasing girls with them. You know, of course you're going to have that. Uh, but... The school officials even ruled out that maybe a bunch of boys wanting to prank the school had uh, just brought in a bunch of fish and laid it around, uh, laid it around the playground. So as of now, it is a mystery. And we have no idea where these fish came from, what they're doing there, or, or any of it. Any of it. Well, I want to head 
to uh, the international Skype line. It looks like I've got a friend of mine here on the line, and uh, welcome to the program. You're on the air. Hey, Eva. Hey, this is Daniel in London, hey. isn't it? This is, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, everyone's still kind of in shock here, riding bang of a slap bang in the middle of an election, which is um, not really what everybody wants, really, with this going on in the background. But um, you know, the one, one point that I'd like to make is that um, it always surprises me that uh, these people who comes out, oh, yeah, they were then known to the authorities. Well, my message is that if you're known to the authorities, you should be taken, given a lie detector test, and um, yeah, dealt with, you know, in a different way. Mm. Really, um, it's, it's, uh, I, I think by banning it or, or, you know, forcing a change on Islam, it's gonna, it will, would definitely make things. It's not a bad idea, but I do think it's a, it's a definitely going to make things worse because mm. it will probably tip people over the edge it that might. were kind of on the fence you know it so. might it might and and i freely admit that i you know don't have the big answer here i think if anybody had the big answer to all of this uh carnage that uh, that solution would be put into place whatever it might be um but you know i heard something about that there are 3500 known uh, uh, well, uh, d- d- terrorists or extremists in the UK, well, people, in Britain. People who've travelled to, uh, to Syria. I mean, like, you know, and I totally agree, if you travel to Syria, why would you be going there? Like, if you don't have any family there, what possible reason would you have to go to Syria? Uh, well, the only... The only... Reasons, but. The only uh, reason that we were given for the bomber in Manchester heading out to to Libya and then returning to Britain was a religious pilgrimage. So those are the those are the reasons that were given. But I saw um, I saw on the news where they were talking about thirty five hundred uh, possible extremists in Britain and that it takes sixty people to watch just one of them. And I say it's worth it. Pay, pay for those 60 people to watch each and every one of those 3,500. I, I would say it's absolutely worth it if it prevents something like this happening in the future. I mean, what, what oh, price can you put yeah. on life? At least that's something oh, yeah. that could be done that's not going to interfere with anybody's life, but we can keep tabs on people that might be likely to do something like this. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, the amount of... Um plans that we've foiled and the amount of um, things that we'd have undercover, I don't do have a lot of faith in, um, in our security services but um, you know, all it takes is one to slip through the net um, really um, unfortunately yeah well and but, that uh, is the truth yeah. it only takes one uh, to do something horrible like this but I can hear it Daniel, in your voice, and my other friends in the UK that I've talked to, uh, they've told me very simply, look, I don't know that I'm going to be able to visit or talk much in the coming weeks because they are absolutely struck by this. I'm so sorry, Daniel, that yeah, this happened. Thank you, thank and you for reporting this. I mean, it, does, it really is not helping that the US are leaking information, mm, yeah. you know, really. I was because, yeah, really not, not, angry, not. actually, to find that out because uh, interfering with the investigation for ratings, I find that pretty sick. Uh, you know what? Let them hold the information close to the vest that they need to in order to conduct their investigation properly. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, look, we we here in the United States absolutely stand with you. <sighs> And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry about all of this. I am also a little bit heartbroken about it. And I keep waking up just stunned, stunned that we live in a world that things like this can happen and that we have to argue over whether, you know, what we need to do to put a stop to it. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure which I'm more sad about. I think, of course, I'm more sad about the attack itself. Um, but look, Daniel, you hold your head up, okay? Oh yeah, thank you. I'm really looking forward to tonight. You just carry on. 
As, as you were, and I'll be calling him with an awesome question later. Well, on I show. sure okay. hope so, man. I'm going to hold you to that now. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, know you you're, see. <laughs> I know you're up very early over there uh, in London right now to be calling me right now. But um, you know what? You hear his voice. That's, that's the tone that I'm getting from my friends in the UK. Uh, it's just a general feeling of you know unspeakable unspeakable sadness shock disappointment you know i i don't even know that i have the words to say exactly everything that they're feeling uh they're still in a state of stunned shock and who can possibly blame them it's going to take a lot of time uh it's good to hear from you daniel really is Oh, my gosh. Uh, Well, let's keep going to the phones. Uh, On line one, you're on the air, and welcome to the show. Hello? Hello. Hi, you're on the air. I know about the fish. You know about the fish. I think I did it when I was in a psychosis in 2011. You what now? (laughs) Well, (laughs) when you go into a psychosis, you can become in a, like, a... um, Shaman-like state. Mm-hmm. And I've been telling my story to psychiatrists over, fucking over, about what's been happening to me, what happened to me. And uh, I just today I was like, I'm pretty sure like all this magic stuff happened to me. And then, um, hold on, all the magic stuff happened to me. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I fixed the drought. And I was like, when I was in my my state, I was like, I have a chance to do magic right now. And no one's going to believe me, but if I could just just be calm enough, I can do a few good things. And um, I did a few things, and one of them was to fix the drought in California. But it was really scary because when you're doing magic, there's no... It's a joke, right? Like, well, no, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a joke. Me, it's, fantasy was a, a, it, my escape. So it kind of ruined my world. Well, it's, it's not a joke, but listen, sweetie, if you're going to do this, just remember to bind down the action not wanted. All right. Let's remember the wise words of Evelyn Paglini and make sure if you're going to end a drought somewhere that you include, we're going to end the drought, but we don't want to cause floods or mudslides. Or fish falling like from the life. sky. You may want to get in touch with the Stanford Avenue Elementary School in Oroville and tell them what you've done. <laughs> right. But that was a reminder for me because I knew that that was five years ago. I, that was a reminder for me because I was like, I'm going to, no one's going to, no one has believed me. So, I mean, doctors have been like, <laughs> the stuff you're experiencing is not, so, but. I just did the fish thing so to remind me that I that I wasn't losing my mind completely. I did the sounds around the world too. Um, you, you are you talking about the booms or the trumpets? Yeah, the trumpets. I, well, okay, now you need to get in touch with Linda Moulton Howe because she's been doing investigations into these sounds and she's trying to get to the bottom of it. So there's a couple people now you got on your do list to get in touch with. Okay, I'm not active anymore with magic. I haven't been in a psychotic state since for a really long time. That was another thing I was like, I'm pretty sure people that about magic that believe in it, I was pretty sure... Looking at like, I'm not sure. Well, I absolutely believe, and um, and and look, just be careful in the future. If there's, if you're trying to well, do <laughs> something like that, just remember to bind down the action not wanted. I mean, that's the best I can tell you. Uh, don't give it up. Okay. All right, don't give up magic just because maybe you had an accident or two. But I think the the folks over at the Stanford Avenue Elementary School may want an explanation. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get in any trouble for that, but I think they might want to know how that happened. Okay, we're at the bottom of the hour. We've got to take us a break, and when we come back, Richard Martini, by the way, thank you very much for your call. 
And Richard Martini will be joining us to talk about the mysterious world between lives. I'm Heather Wade. Well, here we go. Richard Martini is an award, well, excuse me here, uh, author and award-winning filmmaker, and he's written and or directed nine independent films. Richard is a former freelance journalist for FridayVarietyInc.com, Premier, as well as many other magazines. Now, he's also a graduate of the Masters of Professional Writing program at USC. Flipside, A Tourist Guide to the Afterlife, is his debut nonfiction book on a topic that's been haunting him since the death of a soulmate. After a dream vision of visiting his friend in the great beyond, Martini went on a literary quest to find out what the prevailing science and philosophical opinions on the afterlife are. He journeyed into Tibetan philosophy, made documentaries in Tibet and India, and eventually was introduced to the work of the Newton Institute, founded by renowned author and hypnotherapist Dr. Michael Newton, who wrote the book Journey of Souls. And it is a pleasure to welcome Richard Martini to the program tonight. Welcome to the show, Richard, and how are you doing? I'm fabulous. What a treat to be on your show. Well, this is a lot of fun. This is a lot of fun. I mean, I talked to you, gosh, what was it? I don't know, a couple of years ago, I think. And uh, it really is amazing to be on the air with you tonight. Um, Well, it's kind of fun for me also because 40 years ago, I was uh, in my 20s driving from San Francisco down to Los Angeles and driving through the desert one night, late night, back in the days when, you know, your car only had an AM radio, and I was flipping around the dials. Um, There might have been FM, I don't remember, but flipping through the dials, trying to find some station to keep me awake, you know, near Bakersfield. Oh, yeah. That's kind of where I was. And Art Bell came on the radio, and suddenly I was listening and thinking, is this are they kidding? <laughs> he was talking to somebody about something that was so esoteric and so unusual that that it you know, not only kept me awake, saved my life, no doubt, but you know, all these years I've always kept an eye on what Art was up to and he's so lucky to have you hosting a show or hosting this show. Let's put it that way. Well, you know, I kind of got this whole thing by accident, by kind of, he, he, you know, will turn a situation. He can, he somehow can do that. And here we had a tragic situation and he just flipped it and said, you know, let's try to make something good out of this. I know you've always wanted to do this. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. Are you kidding me? I can't do this. And so after an hour, he finally talked me into it, and uh, and here here we are. Which well, I'm fond of saying there are no coincidences. <laughs> I mean, I used to be a guy who, like most people, thought you know the universe was ruled by chaos and coincidence. You know that they were sort of equally uh, somehow working together. But like you said in the introduction, basically. You know, my path in my life as a filmmaker, and I was, you know, working in Hollywood, basically. And at some point, a very dear and close friend of mine, Luana Anders, this actress, passed away in 1996. And after she passed, I had these profound experiences where she came to visit me. And, of course, at first I thought, oh, well, that's a dream, you know. It's funny how we Eskimos have so many words for snow and and Bushmen in Africa have so many words for water. And we just have one word for dream. But it was one of those dreams that wasn't a dream. It was more real. I could see her. She was younger than when I knew her. And it sort of made me wonder, like, where, how did this happen that she could come and visit me? And before she passed away, she told me that she had this recurring dream that she was going to a classroom in some other dimension, the way she put it, in some other universe. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I have this recurring dream where I'm, I'm in a class. Everyone's dressed in white. They're speaking a language I'd never heard before, but somehow I completely understand them. And I thought, you know, that's the morphine drip talking. Mm-hmm. But when she passed, um, her close friend called me from Hawaii and said, oh, I had the most amazing dream about Luana last night. She was in this classroom in the fourth dimension, and everyone was dressed in white. And I thought, <laughs> what? And I asked the nurse about it, and the, her hospice nurse, and she said, yes, this was her you know, recurring dream. So she had been a Buddhist, so I spent some time, I thought, well, maybe Buddhism, you know, that would 
that would explain how she, where these classrooms are and how it was that she was able to come and visit me on a number of occasions. And then one occasion, actually, I had the experience of going to visit her. I had an out-of-body experience. I'm sure you must have talked about that before, but it was I was in Manhattan working on the Charles Grodin show at the time. A good friend of uh, Loana's was Charles Grodin, who had asked me to come and help produce segments on the show. And I had one of these out-of-body experiences where I went to take a nap and suddenly found myself shooting out of my body into deep space. And I can only describe it as like the powers of 10, that movie. So, you know, I saw Manhattan like disappear below me. Mm-hmm. And now I was moving through the stars but I was fully aware of it and, you know, kind of afraid, but at the same time, like, what the heck's going on? And I suddenly found myself going through, I can only describe it as a wormhole because I was bouncing around. Then when I got to the other side, there she was. And she was standing there with her eyes closed. And when I got right in front of her, she opened her eyes as if to say, you were looking for me or wondering about me. Here I am. And at that moment, some nut, honked his horn outside my window. Oh. And but what was odd about it was that I felt the journey back before his hand came off the horn. If you can imagine like a you know a million miles an hour like a rubber band pulling me back into my body. I saw Manhattan coming up at high speed within you know nanosecond and I suddenly was sitting up in my bed and I thought what the heck was that? But instead of dismissing it like a dream, you know, I thought, well if she can draw me or pull me to where she is, how can I go there on my own? Or how can I visit her? If it's possible, right? Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. So it was if somewhere along the line I ran into the work of Michael Newton. And Michael's first book, Journey of Souls, chapter, you know, that was the one. It was this guy was talking about how during his between life session, he saw himself in a classroom where everyone was dressed in white. And I thought, okay, this must be what I'm supposed to be focusing on. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to make a documentary about Michael Newton and his work and and see if this is accurate. Here he was saying that 7,000 of his clients over 30 years said the same things relatively about the afterlife. And I thought, okay, that, you know, any logical person would say he must have been somehow, I, I just didn't know. So I I called up the Institute, and I said, can I make a documentary about Michael? And they said, well, he's retired, but you're welcome to come to one of our our classroom settings. They were doing a conference in Chicago. So I went to my hometown, and I met Michael, and he said, all right, I'll give you my last interview. Um, He didn't pass away until about a month ago, a couple months ago. And this was back in 2007 or 8. Mm. But anyway, um, I had read all of his books, and so I interviewed him. And he told me about his process and his journey. And it was amazing. And I I interviewed his wife because, you know, this way I could corroborate some of the things he was saying. So I said to her, like, at what point did you think, what did you think when your husband came home saying that these 7,000 people were saying the same things about the afterlife? That after we die, we journey into this other place where our friends and relatives are, this place that they often refer to as home, where classrooms exist, all of these different, you know, avenues. And she said, well, I I thought they were going to take away his license. I thought thought he was, he'd gone insane. She said, until I heard the tapes. And she said, you know, I heard these tapes because he shared his research with me. And I, I realized all these people from different walks of life under hypnosis saying the same things about the afterlife, there must be something to it. So I realized in that moment that I needed tapes. And I asked them if it was possible to film some of these sessions because, you know, cameras now, you can run it for eight hours. A typical Newton session or Michael Newton's session, as he calls them, you know, between life sessions was a person comes in to do. uh, Have you ever done hypnosis, Heather? I have not. No, but we've talked a lot about it on the program. Uh, It's a fascinating subject. In fact, I, I don't know if. (laughs) <laughs> My producer's probably listening. She does hypnotherapy. Uh, yes, we mentioned, she mentioned that to me. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Well, I would just, you know, for your audience members who are kind of wondering about it, it's it's kind of a misnomer because you're never under hypnosis when you do it. You're um, they, It's like a yoga instructor giving you a guided meditation. 
Mm-hmm. No more or less than that. Somebody saying, just relax, picture yourself on a boat on a river, and you imagine the things that are coming to mind. It's just that after they do these sessions for three or four or five hours, you get so relaxed that when they say, now where would you like to go? Your mind, your subconscious takes you to wherever it is that you want to show them. It's not them asking you, would you like to go to your previous lifetime as Cleopatra? They just say, let's go to the earliest memories you have of this lifetime. And then you remember whatever you can. And then they say, so let's go to a previous lifetime that has some significance to this life. And it's at that moment. Now, when after I'd done this research, Michael Newton turned to the guy who was running the program and said, why don't you have Rich do a session? And I thought, Okay, well, if I film myself do a session, I mean, am I, you know, is this like a George Plimpton moment? Am I becoming part of the story itself? But I thought, why not? This way I can prove it's not real because I haven't gone in to find a past life. I'm actually trying to prove it's fake or false, or I won't be led, you know, I won't let the hypnotherapist lead me somewhere. You see, oh, I, I, I like this already. <laughs> well, I had, you know, that idea that somehow he's going to, you know, put a watch in front of me and say, you know, let's let's go back to the Civil War. But he didn't. He just, you know, said, let's go back through your life. And I did. And, it, and at some point he said, all right, let's go to a previous life to, of, you know, a life that uh, has some significance to you. And I didn't see anything. And I said, I don't see anything. And I was determined to say, I don't see anything for four hours if, it, if that was what it took. But at some point he said... Well, just look down. And I looked down, and I saw my feet in a creek. And I said, okay, that's weird. I'm seeing my feet in a creek. And he said, "Um, are you wearing shoes? I said, no, my feet are all cut up. And then he said, now, what are you you wearing? What kind of clothes are you wearing? And as I saw myself sort of pull back, I, I saw myself standing there in a Native American outfit. Consciously, I was thinking, oh, come on, Rich. You're making this up, man. You're making your up that you're a Lakota, a Sioux, medicine man. That's what I said I was. And and then I said, he said, well, what's your name? And I said, oh, it sounds like uh, Watanka. And my conscious mind, because this is what happens when you're doing these sessions, my conscious mind was going, come on, Rich, you saw Dances with Wolves. You can't even say Tonka correctly. That means Buffalo. No, you said Watanka. You like God. What's wrong with you? And then he said, "Do you want to go visit your your tribe or your people?" And I said, "I really don't." He said, "Why?" And then I saw in my mind's eye this this um, you know the Otipis and huts and a, a, like a disaster. They had been massacred, and I saw fires and dead people everywhere. Horrific. And I'm thinking to myself because I'm feeling the emotion of that. Like, oh my God, look at all these dead people. And then I went to a teepee. I've never been near a teepee. You know, I grew up in Chicago. I live in LA, you know, as far from a teepee as I can get. But I could feel the leather on my hand, the raw rawness of the leather. I've never touched one before, but I felt it, you know, the skin. Mm-hmm. And I opened, up, opened it up and there was a woman lying on the ground, dead, with her throat cut. And I said... They've killed my wife and taken my son. And as I said it, I felt the full emotion of that sentence. And as I began to sob, I was consciously thinking, why would you ever make this up? This is easily the most painful emotion I've ever experienced, I've ever had in my lifetime. How can I make that up? But so anyway, and at some point he said, what happened here? I said, oh, it was the God, it was the Huron. And consciously, I was thinking, Huron, Sue, Huron are in upstate New York. How could that, you know, so your conscious mind is always debating. Now, if I can just tell you that six months later, I was at a funeral in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, talking to my cousin. I said, what are you doing these days? He said, I'm, I'm working with the Lakota. I'm like a historian for them. I said, well, how weird is that? Let me tell you about this session I had. He said, wait a second, just tell me, what were you wearing? I said, buckskin. He said, how many feathers did you have? I said, two. He said, were they up? Put his fingers up. I said, no, they were down. He said, oh, that means you're a medicine man. I said, medicine? Well, 
why did I call myself Watanka? He laughed. He said, Wakantanka, it means the great spirit. That would be a derivative of that. That's what they would call you, a worker of the great spirit. And then I said, wait, what about this thing about the Huron? He said, you're sitting in the spot where they fought for 60 years, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Those are all details I could not look up, and I tried, until after he told me this. And then I was able to find the forensic evidence that, indeed, what I saw was accurate. And what I try to call this information I'm talking to you about is new information. Uh Aha, okay. Like last night, you guys, you talked about dreams. Yeah. So if something happens in a dream or in one of these, or let's say through a medium or through other, or a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience, something happens or is said or is learned that's new information. In other words, it can't be cryptonesia, which is what medicine or science calls past life memories, like somehow you heard it or saw it or saw it in a movie and you're just imagining right. it. Right. You extrapolate it, it, it from things you see in life. Right. And so it's new information, meaning they're telling you something specifically, like the car keys for the Buick are in the trunk under Grandpa's shoe. That's a new piece of information that no one knows but only the person who passed away knows. So I've been focusing on this particular aspect of it. Um, My father, when he passed away, uh, the night he passed, I was back home in Northbrook, where I'm from. Hello, Northbrook fans. Um, And I heard his voice. He woke me up and he said, uh, I need you to write something down. I was like, what, Dad? And he said, I'm experiencing indescribable beauty, indescribable joy. And I was like, wow, okay. I'd never heard him say anything like that. What do you want me to say? And so he had me write this note. My mother, I love you. I'm here with mom and papa. And he named six individuals I've never heard of. But I wrote their names down. And the next day I said to my mom, listen, I had this dream. You know, there's that word again. I had this dream. I think dad came to visit me and he mentioned these six people. I said, who are they? And she said, oh, those are his friends who died in World War II. Oh, my God. So they were not names I had access to or knew. My mom knew. It was his way of giving her a detail that only she would know to be true, a verification on some level that he's still here, he still exists, he's still around. So my first book, Flipside, is transcripts of these sessions, of these deep hypnosis sessions. I think there's 12 in there. Mm-hmm. where people talk about not only their previous lifetime, but then this journey in between lives, which we can talk about, my own journey. But the second book is called It's a Wonderful Afterlife. There's a volume one and two. And there, that's mostly scientists talking about consciousness studies. Dr. Bruce Grayson at the University of Virginia, he's the father of near-death experiences. He pointed out that science doesn't consider hypnosis a valid scientific tool. I understand why, because there's all the problems of person wants to be, wants to find a past life and maybe the doctor wants to, you know, cure them. There's problems. But in, in the case of Newton here, he had 7,000 people. And then I found other doctors, Dr. Helen Wamba. She had also done hypnosis. She had 2000 cases where people recalled their life planning session where they chose while they were on the flip side, while they were back home in the between lives realm, chose their parents, chose who they were going to be, chose the journey and the difficulties that they would experience in their lifetime. Not like a concrete, locked in cement storyline, like a script, mm-hmm. more like an improvisational stage play. Or like an you, outline. Yeah, like an outline or like three by five cards. You know, you and I and a bunch of people get in a room together, and Heather, you had this experience, all right, Mm -hmm. at some point. All I can tell you is I've filmed 35 people under deep hypnosis. I've filmed many sessions where people recall their life planning session. One guy said it was like arguing a doctoral thesis in front of his counsel, as he called it, Um, and where you basically worked out some of the trauma that you're going to experience because perhaps you wanted to learn about negative neg- negativity or illness 
so that you could be a doctor in a future lifetime, like a student, like right. being part of a classroom. So, I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit about the between life realm? Oh, definitely, because I was doing some reading on this, and I, and I was uh-huh. trying to figure out, how do you even prepare for a program on this subject, right? That's <laughs> a challenge right there to begin with. It's not like I have an instruction book to refer no, to no, here. I, listen, I know, I, I totally agree with you, and... You know, I've sat with many, many people who go, well, you need to talk to universities about this. You know, you need to go to scientists about this. And I go, look, I'm sorry. They're just it, the body of work. You know, Michael Newton was the first guy I ran into. Subsequently, I've ferreted out other people. Helen Wamba's work was a decade prior to Newton's. And you find conversations and, you know, listen, at one point I was like, well, wait a second. You people are, these people are claiming that everything that we know about the nature of reality is slightly off. Yes. You know, like taking the red pill. Yes. And, yes. and then, but then I started to realize when I started to look at books of, you know, like the Bible or like the, the Bhagavad Gita or other great, the Quran, books about the nature of reality, of why we're here. And I started to find these comments where people would talk about an experience where they met an angel, let's say, or they met someone from the other side who came with a message. And these messages are kind of consistent that over there, back home, we experience unconditional love. It's a term that we're not, we don't really use on right. our planet. Yes, right. We know what it is, you know. But but if I asked you to define it, you'd have to say, well, between a pet and a, a you know, a, some an owner, between two lovers, or but usually between a mother and a child, or a parent and a child, unconditional love. We kind of sense what that is. It's not in beer commercials, certainly, but consistently in near-death experiences, and I've studied thousands, consistently, I've about 70%, let's say, people will talk about this feeling they had while during their near-death experience or during or while they're under deep hypnosis, where they talk about this feeling when they get home. Well, that's the thing uh, that I figured out. In order to prepare for this, really the only material or the best material, I would think, would be the experiences themselves. And so that's what I did. I read uh, about session after session after session, and these are long sessions. They go on for three, four, sometimes five hours. Um, And I did notice some consistencies, like the one you're mentioning and a couple others. And uh, here we are. We're at the top of the hour already, Rich. So let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk about these consistencies among all of these different experiences of people that claim they've been in this place, this life between lives place. Um, cool. And, we'll take a trip there. Uh, yeah, that's that's the best plan I got right now. And I'm sure that will lead <laughs> us on to wherever else we're going to head into wherever else tonight. We go. Yes, uh, Richard Martini is here tonight. And we're talking about that mysterious place in between lives that most of us, well, are end up going to go going to end up going there at some point, right? So that's what we're going to talk about when we come back. I'm Heather Wade. Well, I have a little bit of a report here for listeners that are out in Texas. Uh, My buddy, Douglas D.B. Stearns, he just gave me this information. Apparently, there's been uh, the ground shook in Texas tonight, and there was uh, reports of a very loud uh, bang and flash in the sky. Well, that's because that uh, the SpaceX had two nitrogen tanks explode. And uh, if you are out there in Texas and you're wondering what in the world that sound was and what shook the ground, that's what did it. So thank you, D.B., uh, for that report. And we'll get right back to Richard Martini. Um, welcome back to the program. So we were, we were talking about consistencies in the reports of people that have these life between lives, hypnotic regressions. And, and the one you were talking about right before the break was was unconditional love. Um, something else that I found when I was reading some of these uh, report or accounts, mm-hmm. what do we call them, uh, experiences, uh, was 
a council, like you mentioned, a council. Uh, there was yeah, also talk right. of some kind of library and soul groups. <laughs> uh, soul groups, all that stuff. Well, I was going to say, as we come back, you know, because I do always dangle that. So I did find Luana. I did go visit her in her classroom. I had that experience because when I did my session, and again, I was Joe Skeptic, Joe Hollywood. I didn't think I was going to get anywhere. I really thought this was going to be an exercise in me saying I don't see anything. After, at the end, the way Michael Newton does the the sessions is that he just briefly touches upon a previous lifetime. And then they ask you, let's go to the last day of your life. And I saw myself as this broken man with a bottle of whiskey that he had finished, that I had finished, and decided I would walk into... I think it might have been the Mississippi. It was a giant river. And the hypnotherapist said, Jimmy Quast from Maryland, he said, so where are we? I said, well, I'm, I'm at the edge of this river, and I'm, I'm walking into it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, why? I'm a shell of who I was. They took my religion. They took my people. They took my family. They took everything I cared about. I just want to go home. Now, when I said it, I was thinking to myself, wow, that's great dialogue. I like that. But but that was the feeling. I wanted to go home. And I saw myself bobbing down this river. And then in the experience that I had, and everybody has their own experience, but in my experience, I flew back to this place and I saw people coming up quickly out of like a mist, about 20, 20 to 30 people who were really excited to see me. And I had this feeling of, of like coming off stage, you know, and, and people like, oh, well, you did such a great job in that lifetime. And I met my, what Newton termed a spirit guide. And it's, it's everybody has one. Sometimes people have more than one. But it's somebody whose task it is to watch over all of your lifetimes and to help keep you on the path that you chose and to help you explore and do things that you chose. So when I got back there, I, I had this experience of meeting this guy. In most of Newton's cases, he said, you know, people are so overwhelmed because it's like they're a, a mortal teacher. In my case, I had this kind of odd experience of like, this is my friend. And he was like, how you doing? I was like, I'm okay. And then he took me to this place that could only be described as a place of healing, where it's like I reconnected with the energy I left behind. And this is consistent in Newton's work. And in my work, two-thirds of your energy stays back there in this home place. And only about a third of our energy comes here during our incarnations. My Why? God, that is so similar to what Dr. Schwartz talks about. Oh, okay, Gary. Yeah, he's a good pal. We've, you know, we've, uh, we've, he, wrote the, um, he wrote the introduction to Flipside. We're good pals. And, um, but that idea of a third just a third of your energy is here. Why is that? Well, some people have said to me, um, it's because if you brought more energy, you'd blow the circuits. And then inevitably the question is, well, what about these people that are like avatars, you know, that have walked the earth, that are like holy men? Well, the answer was they brought more energy. They brought more of their source energy. Like the, the between lives, we're all connected to source. We're all part of the same ocean of energy, let's call it that. And when we're here, we're individual bottles of water. But when we leave the bottle of water at the end of our life, we dissipate and we go back to the ocean. And the ocean is this, but we're in our individual place back in that ocean. We're with our friends. And so what people say is, and Newton's work showed that everybody has a soul group and it's anywhere from three to 25 people where they average, sometimes more, sometimes less. Mm -hmm. And uh, in these sessions, people, you'll say, so, you know, who are these people? They'll say, oh, it's my soul group. These are the people I normally incarnate with. And within there, you recognize people who've had a significant role in your life. Sometimes they're the enemy or the person that you thought you hated. But in this therapy, in this moment, you realize, oh, my God, I asked you to play that role so I could learn that lesson about negativity. Oh, my God. Or, or they show that to you. And I've filmed many of these cases. A very close friend of mine revealed on the way to a session that, that she had been molested as a child. I did not know that. During the session, she saw the perpetrator in her soul group 
and suddenly said, oh, I see, I asked, I, I, I agreed, not I asked, I agreed to participate in this lesson for him in negativity, and I did it out of love for him. But between lives, I can see that everything's okay. These are every stage performance. If you think of it as a stage performance, is a stage performance. You learn. You you go through all kinds of conflict, and conflict's the essence of drama. You you that's how you learn. You know, if your life was boring and you came here, and nothing happened. You know, you'd go back home, and they your friends would look at you like, well, that was boring. You know, I sat here and watched you through all that, you know, everything. It's like, put me to sleep like six times. But when, but you find in these cases where people claim, oh, in my previous lifetime, I got blown up in the field. But when I got back, everybody was applauding and going, oh my, you did. That was a shock. We had no idea that that was how the play was going to turn out. That's another, um, I guess, consistency, another uh, thing that just comes up in all the reports that I read from people who had experienced this was contracts. That's what I think you're talking about. These contracts that they make in between lives that I'm going to go through this or I may die tragically or this tragic thing may happen to me because of somebody in my soul group. And I'm agreeing to that ahead of time. Ahead of time. And, and, you know, we, the word contract is a pejorative, you know, because we think of attorneys and, you know, are we being held to it? We have free will, according to all these reports, that we can say no. When our friends and loved ones plan a lifetime and they say, look, we want you to play the alcoholic father, and you say, you have the right, the free will to say, no, I've done that before. We did that in the Viking era. That bored me. But they come to you and say, look, you're so good at it. I will never learn the lesson unless you play that role. And they wear you down. (laughs) And they basically say, you're the best actor for this part. You're the Olivier of bad parents. And you say, oh, okay, I'll do it this time. So you come and you play this role. Of course, you learn other things. You're not just the bad parent. You learn all kinds of stuff. I know this is very uncomfortable for people to address. All I can say is I'm a reporter here. This is not a belief or a philosophy or something that I'm trying to convince people of. This I'm just reporting what people have said consistently over these 7,000 cases of Michael Newton, the 2,000 cases of Helen Wamba, and the 35 cases I've filmed. But basically it goes like this. We pass away, however that transpires. We then, and we, some people stick around here because they're not, they want to hang out. They want to be with their loved ones. They want to keep an eye on people. That's, time now changed. So time is kind of different Let's just put it that way. It's just it's relatively different over there. So it's not a big deal to stick around here for 10 years or 100 years because it just doesn't feel that long over there. Okay? Time but, has no meaning on the other side. I had a near-death well, experience uh, once, and that is well, something it, I know for sure. Okay. Oh, you did? Okay, very good. I've um, In my research, I had this discussion with, with people. My latest book, Hacking the Afterlife, I use mediums to have conversations with people on the other side, people who've passed away, in hopes of finding new information. And we get to a point where I'm interviewing someone who's passed away, and we start talking about what time feels like to them. And I hear all kinds of different examples. I can tell you that it's, they all kind of feel the same way, that time doesn't really exist over there. It exists relatively, like it's linear because you have young souls and you have old souls. Like you eventually go through all your lifetimes and you become an old, wise soul. But it just doesn't feel that long. So, for example, a friend of mine, she had a lifetime, 25-year lifetime here that I was able to find, a, like a ship's captain in 1610. I was able to find a guy. And but when she returned home, she said, "Oh God, that felt like felt like ten minutes from my twenty five years felt like ten minutes." Mm-hmm. So if that's just as a as a um, signpost, whatever you call it, a yardstick, if you think of twenty five years is ten minutes over there, then two hundred fifty years not so much. Twenty five hundred years is like a week, you know, in terms of how it feels to them. You see. Mm-hmm. Anyway, at some point when you're when you get back there, which people refer to as home, consistently, you get back and you 
usually you first stop at a, a way station, let's call it that, where you re-energize with your higher self that's been left behind. And that's a dramatic moment of reconnecting with yourself. And you really are able to access all your previous lifetimes and, and much more information. Not all information. You're not, not omniscient. But you get all the information that, that's in your library. Let's put it that way. And then you then you visit the council, and these these council anywhere from three to twelve people, roughly. This is just general what people say. They're there for you, and they're only there for you. They're not there to judge you, but you find yourself in front of them, and they say some version of "How'd you do?" And you say, "I screwed up," <laughs> or <laughs> "I think I did a great job." And they go, "Oh, really?" Well, let's look at some of the things you did, like a life review. They'll go over it with you. And, of course, people punish themselves, rightly so, because they hurt people or they made people angry or they didn't fulfill their contract. They checked out. Whatever it is they did, they feel awful that they did it. If you want to call that punishment and hell, it, I would say, I would argue that people do experience in their life review very difficult because it's reported consistently that they experience the negativity that you engendered from the from the per the victim, the person who experienced your anger, your violence. You get to re-experience how they felt. Yes, uh, during so my near death oh, yeah? experience. Uh, now I didn't meet up with a council of elders or anything like that, and I didn't see a tunnel or a light or anything. It really uh -huh. felt like I was traveling in space. Um, and then I end up at a particular area of space. I can't say that I understand all of this. I, this is just what I know happened to me. And I remember the life review, and I felt all the joy and all the pain and every emotion wow. that I had ever given to another living thing. I got to feel that in return, and it was virtually all at once. Wow. Wow. That's wonderful, and I and it is consistent with what what people report. And and the only other thing about you know that is that eventually, your friends try to say to you, well, let's do it again. And and I don't know how long. It's really up to you how long you might want to stay back there and hang out. Like I say, you have free will. You can say no, I don't want to go back. But ultimately, you may go to your uh, library of records, mm -hmm. and everybody describes the library differently. It's not the same library, but apparently, because I've never seen the same account, but I've seen hundreds of accounts where people describe holographic screens or like stacks of books and you take a, open up a book and then there is like a holographic reality of a previous lifetime. And you examine all these things that you've done or other people have done. And then from that, you extrapolate who you're, what you're going to do the next time around. And with your loved ones, people you normally incarnate with, you plan the next journey. You plan the Heather Wade journey. You go, all right, here's what I'm going to do. It's going to feel like a coincidence that I get this job, but I'm going to be passing this information along to help heal people on the planet. My voice will carry a healing message to people, which is why I do this work, honestly. I get emails from people who say, whatever you said last night, open my head up and I feel more connected to the planet today, and I want to thank you for that. And I, I always say, look, it's not me. It's just what these people are saying consistently. But, you know, here's what's, what I've been doing lately, and this might be value to you, Heather, which is I've, because I've filmed so many of these sessions, I've found that I can ask people while they're fully conscious to access information while that happened to them in a dream or that happened to them in a near death experience mm -hmm. and they can find new information or re-examine it. Would you like to do that? That's incredible. Yes. Okay. So, um, everybody pull up a chair, get out your cup of tea, <laughs> put your Coca-Cola in your drink and, Let's see where we go. We don't know where we're going to go. We have no idea. And you and I didn't talk about this. We weren't planning to do this. But no, this is a spur of the moment as it gets. This is exactly. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that, you know, in your near-death experience, and I'm sure you've told a lot of people, I don't know your near-death experience, and I don't want you to revisit it at the moment because I'm more interested in what happened during the traveling through space moment. So in your mind's eye, just do your best 
to revisit that moment, like a freeze frame, at some moment while you're traveling, and just prior to the moment where you did the the um, past life review. Okay. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so just just go to that moment. Now, tell me, you you feel like you're moving through space? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Tell me what that feels like. It feels like there should be wind, and there's no oh, okay. wind. It's so are you are you moving up, across, down? I'm moving. What I'm moving up and then across. I'm getting up out. Of, I'm out of the Earth's atmosphere, and now I'm going across space incredibly fast. And and the thing. Okay that I'm asking myself is how come there's no wind? How come I'm not inside a, a structure or a ship of some kind? I'm not in anything. It's just... Well, you've seen magnets move across a table. I've heard people describe it that way, like you're being pulled. Yes. But you're the magnet, so you're just moving. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like, it's like... And so now when you get to the next destination, or do you get to a next destination, where, what... What is the next visual that you see? Is there anything around you? There's tiny pin lights, and they're going okay. by incredibly fast. They're going by so fast I can't keep up. And then okay, all of a sudden, yeah, there, there's a there's a an abrupt slowing down, and now I know I'm somewhere. But it's still dark, okay. and it's still space. And okay, very good. I've stopped for some reason. I don't know why. Now, are I there any pin lights around you? Any of those lights around you? Yes, yes. And what looks like a really colorful cloud. Uh, okay, let's do me a favor. Let, I, because we can do this. Let's just go over to the cloud. I want you to, in your mind's eye, even if it didn't happen then, I want you to go over to the cloud. Okay. And tell me what, as you get closer, what are the colors associated with the cloud? Well, it's... It's beautiful. It's almost like it's almost like a fire uh, that has just stopped. That's still in time, if you can imagine. So it's bright, bright oranges, red, yellows, whites, um, all of these okay. kind of colors. Do me a favor. I want you to walk into the cloud or put your hand inside the cloud. What does that feel like? Oh, well, it feels like pressure and it feels very very warm uh not too hot i can if i wanted to i know i could i could go inside the thing well let's do that then okay go on, go on in okay what does that feel like well it's in, it's very very warm uh it's incredibly warm it's like um heat warmth or emotional warmth or what kind of warmth well both actually okay uh there's uh there's a contentment there uh there's ah okay that's interesting a contentment what does that mean um that means i feel like i've been here before uh, but I'm not sure. It's almost like a, a memory from when you were one years old or something like you're really trying to remember being here before. But it does feel like I've been here before. And Excellent. It feels like a very hot summer day that I would not be able to survive in a body. But it, it feels like it's 150 degrees. But somehow that feels good. But go to the moment. So you remember being there. There's a feeling of remembrance. Yes. Of b having been there. So I'll tell you what, instead of going to, I was going to say, go to the moment you were last there, which would be a whole trip into another lifetime. Let's just move through this cloud. And what do you see on the other side of it? Hmm. It's not that I see something. It's that I that? feel a presence there. Okay, very good. And is this a male or a female presence? This is a male presence. And tell me, describe about how old is this presence, just in terms of human ideas? Is this an, an old, old person, or is this a young person, or? Oh gosh, I you know it's it's impossible to know. It feels like this presence has always been there, and it's okay. always here whenever I come to this place. Okay, very good. And so, oh, I see. So it's a little difficult to describe. So, but it is a male presence. 
And let's ask the presence, because we're here and we can, and we're on the radio. <laughs> let's ask this presence to appear in a human form so that you can ask questions to this male presence. Could you do that? Is in, that possible? In a human form, I will try. Just ask him, dude. Can you, can you, give her an access that so we can have a conversation with you? Okay. Now I'm getting an image, Richard, and I I don't know if people are going to laugh at this, but I'm getting a very distinct image of a of a man. Um, okay. And it's don't a, judge it. Very tall. Um, okay. And and the man has long white hair, and uh, it white looks hair. very, very Chinese to me. Okay, very good. Try not to judge any of this. Just allow for a second that we're playing a game. We're having some fun, right? Don't take any of this so serious. I'm saying this to your audience. Just we're having some fun here. So this is a person that's in her mind's eye. So thank you person in your mind's eye for showing up for us you have long white hair about how tall is this fella about about six feet tall six feet tall okay very good i'm going to ask him a direct question because he's aware of what i'm doing you may not be but he is i want him to give you a name put a name inside your mind that we can address him as Anything that comes to mind, the first letter of his name is? Uh, it's a C. And the second letter? H. And the third? O. Okay. Next, And the next letter? Fourth? Uh, w. Okay. And anything else? And an N. Chown. I don't, I, Chown, I, which I, is Italian for how you doing. <laughs> Mr. Chown. I have no okay, idea what good. this means. Uh, I oh. don't, don't judge it. It's okay. okay. Well, this is a little okay. bit weird in the middle of I, all it this. It is weird. That's why we're doing this. Um, but I, we got to... I just want to clarify. What? Well, we do what? We do have to take a break. Uh, that's what's no, no. weird about it. I wish I didn't, um, but we do have it's, to uh, take it, a break. It, in six minutes? Uh, well, I'm due to take a break now. So Okay. Um, well, first, before we take the break, just really quickly, Mr. Chown... Thank you for showing up here, and I want you to stick around with us through the break so we can ask you some questions about her experience. Well, now I'm in this really weird like, headspace, so don't I, I don't know that I'm going to just not, he's, come no, out no, of he's that. Fine. He's not going anywhere. You're fine. I'm, okay. You're fully conscious. It's okay. okay. All right. Well, this is really a lot of fun tonight. I had no idea that any of this was going to happen. And if I sound a little spacey, it's because I am a little spacey, but we'll be right back, everybody. Whoa, we certainly are doing something different tonight, aren't we? I, I, I don't know that I've ever been in a hypnotic state or anything close to it doing the program, but I have to tell you, I am thankful for all my months of experience because now running the show is sort of muscle memory, so that's a good thing. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Rich Martini back onto the program. So, Richard, I got to tell you, I have this very strong, strong image in my mind of this very tall good. man who looks like a cross between like Pai Mei and a tall, thin, laughing Buddha, and, and he was laughing at me the entire break. <laughs> That's great. Oh, I love that. And, you know, I I just want to thank him for sticking around. I, I'm going to call him Mr. Chow just because it's easier for us, right, for us back here on the planet. Chow is probably a, a more close to a – it's either the name he's giving you because he has a sense of humor <laughs> or he's just <laughs> – He's, you know, transversing chow and clown. You know, I've heard I've heard spirit guides say, you know, yeah, my name is I'm my my clown suit's in the cleaners. Now, Mr. Chow, we're going to ask him some direct questions. And I don't mean to put you in a hypnotic state because like you, we're just conversing. You know, you've had coffee. I'm drinking water. We're all fine. We're fully awake. But you've had a profound spiritual experience by having a near-death experience. And my contention is is that everything that happens to us, mind-wise, stays up there. Not only in this lifetime and many lifetimes, but just in terms of our lifetime, while we're asleep, your brain is still recording things. There is no delete key in the mind. So including this experience, this journey that you had. So now 
asking Mr. Chow to appear here, and we're giving him that name. It's maybe not his name, but it's, we're just giving it to him because um, it's easy for us to access. And I asked him to take form so that you could we could have a conversation. So first things first, I want you to do me this favor. I want you to, in your mind's eye, reach over and take his hands in yours. All Can right. you do that? Yes, yes. And tell, describe to us what does that feel like? Well, uh, I feel uh, another, it, it's very, very warm. Uh, he's okay. got uh, incredible life. It's almost like touching a living person. Okay. And can you feel his hands? I mean, does it does it feel like hands? What does it feel like? Yeah, yes, it does. It feels like soft, uh, soft hands of maybe an older person. Um, okay. But it definitely feels like human hands. And let's ask him. Um, I'm going to ask him a question. First, I want you to do something for me. I want you to imagine yourself stepping over his shoulder and looking back at yourself. Or shift your consciousness into his point of view, just directly. That's the easiest way to do it. Just zip over into his eye. And now look at yourself. What do you look like? Oh, my God. I, uh, I am just, um, all I am is, is light. That's all it okay. is. It's like a peach-colored light. Peach colored light. Now, take take closer look at that that light. Is it vibrating? Is it solid? What is it? It's pulsing. Pulsing and like slowly, quickly. Uh, rather slowly. Yes. Okay. And so, and now, as you look at yourself, and you from his point of view, this is how he sees you. This is new information. You see, this is not something you and I have discussed or you have ever considered. But this is new information that's coming from him or from you, either way. But you're able to see yourself. All right, let's look back at him again, make it a little more comfortable, because, you know, he's done this thing. Tell me about his eyes. Does he have, what color are his eyes? Oh, his eyes are are black, actually, oh. um, but they're very, uh -huh. very shiny. And this guy is very incredibly happy. Um, he's <laughs> laughing, and actually, uh, something I heard was, well, why didn't you ask me to do this before? It would have been so much easier. <laughs> I love that he's chastising you. So, well, okay, dude, like, don't beat her up already, but we're here now, okay? So, so we want to ask you a couple of questions. We want to ask you about Heather's journey. How is she doing in her journey, Mr. Chow, would you tell her, put, a, put in her mind what you think about her journey? Oh, well, now, isn't that funny? Uh, okay, so all I can do is give you a response in the exact words here. Please do. Please and, do. Uh, and that is, well, she didn't want to, but now that she's on the path, she's having a much better time. Oh, very good. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And can you show, have you, let me ask you, Mr. Chow, have you ever incarnated on the planet with her? Not with, no. Not with her? Have you ever incarnated on our planet? Let me just ask you that. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Would you do me a favor and put in, in her mind's eye when that was, like roughly a year and a place? Where were you? Uh, saying it would be so long ago, uh, it's hard to know a year. He's saying before history. Okay, I understand. Thank you. That's fine. And did you, where you appear, did you, are you on the planet as a humanoid or were you on like an animal or some other, some other entity? I mean, you know, insect, uh, whatever, some other life form. Let's not judge it. Mm, human. Human. Okay, very yes. good. And before history, I see. All right. And I assume, are you, let me ask you, I'm just going to skip down. <laughs> are you her guide? Would, would, is that the term that we should consider you, her spirit guide? Yes. Okay, very good. And, and you could have said no, it's possible. Uh, are you a member of her soul group or does she have a separate group for that? A separate group. And how many people are in her soul group? If you could just give her a number. Eighteen. Eighteen. Very good. 
And and do me a favor, Mr. Chow. Would you take her to a council, please? And I want you, Heather, to um, now just be there now in front of your council and tell me, are you inside or are you outside? Oh, now this is really weird. Okay. okay. Uh, this is really <laughs> strange because it's like an outdoor area, but it's in space. Okay, very good. And and are there how many people are there in this council? Uh, I can count right quick. Uh, I don't. It seems like there's a dozen beings there. Oh, very good. Okay, twelve, twelve dozen. Um, and so now look at the council. Is I you know do you, start with the far left? Are they by the way? Are they how are they arrayed? Is this a straight line? Is it a semicircle? Are they sitting or standing? Uh, it, it's a circle. It's a completed okay. circle, and I'm in okay. the middle. Oh, very good. I, now, this is something that Michael Newton's uh, practitioners don't really do, but it's something that I found you can do. Let's go over to the person who seems to be the spokesperson for the council. Just pick one of the group, male or female. Well, there's a female with a book, and it looks like she's in charge. Oh, very good. Let's go over to her. Do you mind? And I want you to stand in front of her. Okay. And tell me, describe to her. What does she look like? Describe to us. Uh, well, she also looks Chinese to me. Uh, she okay. also has long white hair. Um, she's wearing Interesting. white clothes that almost reflect up onto her face. So she she's incredibly white. Uh, there's this About white how glow. old is she, roughly, oh. in, in this Guys, I mean, the way she looks. I'm going to guess she looks sort of ageless, but uh, I could guess 30s, maybe. In her 30s. All right, very good. Do me a favor. Go over and grab her hand. Not grab. Go over and offer your hand and see if you can reach out and take her hand in yours. And tell me, describe to me what that feels like. Ah, gosh. Um, Well, it's strange because I can feel the crease in her hand where she was holding on to the book. Oh, cool. Uh, but soft, and she's smiling at me, and she's saying, it's been a long time. Sweet. Can I? we ask her her name or a, a name so that we can use, so we can address her directly? Uh, the name, uh, Chen. Chen. And, and would, Miss Chen, would you show our friend here the book that you were looking at? And what is that book? What, could you open it up for her and, just, and show it? And just tell us what you see in the book. Oh, uh, there's, there's my name. There's pictures. How is it written? Is it written in script or is it written in bold or what's the typeface? Okay, this is very strange because it's not in any language I'm familiar with uh, here in the waking world. It's a different... I understand. It looks like it's made up of uh, different characters that I'm familiar with, but I can read I see. it. Kind of what Luana was saying about her her classroom, a language that she understood but never spoken before. But you understand that that is your name. And and now describe what you see inside the book. Can, are there pages? Can you turn them? Or how does that appear to you? Um, yes, there's pages. And I can turn so, the pages. Okay, so turn to some page that Miss Chen would like you to look at. Okay. Uh, she's opening up the book. It's going back deep into the book. Um Okay. Okay. So now, I don't know. Uh, it's like three quarters of the way into this book. I would, I'm just guessing. Uh-huh. And I see a picture of a house. Okay, there's a picture of a house. Looks, does it look familiar? Yeah, it does. Looks like where I live. Oh, lovely. Okay. Oh, so- my God. It's... Uh, I'm sitting on the porch and now I have white hair and I'm sitting on the porch wow. and I'm rocking in this chair and oh, sweet. I'm just sort of staring out and, uh, and it looks, it looks like I'm just a have, okay, this is weird because it's a, it looks like a photograph, but the picture's moving like I'm cool. rocking in this rocking chair. And, uh, if I look out 
there's you know you can see the wind in the trees and everything this is uh so it's it's like a moving wow, photograph very cool that is so cool i've never never heard of such a thing never experienced such a thing i've never asked anybody to open a book before this is my first time experiencing this this is new information for me as it is for you um miss chen because we happen to be doing this live on the air and people are listening in from around the world, would you please give us a message? Now, I understand you're not omniscient, Mrs. Miss Chen. I understand you're not a deity, but I understand you are an older soul who has been with this person for many, many, many years. And what you might be able to tell us, because we live in a world which has a lot of set stress and a lot of sorrow and a lot of pain, Please, can you talk a little bit to us or, or put words in her mind, and Heather's mind, so she can explain a little bit about the journey of souls? Things are not... Okay, th- this is just what I'm hearing here. Sure, okay? please. Because I don't want people to get the impression that I'm channeling anything or anything. You're, I am not. not. I'm asking Miss Chen to talk through you, but we so you can interpret it with syntax however you best you can let's not judge it go ahead things seem so large and so immediate but things pass and the pain is not what matters it's the love that matters and it's how you talk to each other that matters. And I'm asking for more, and she's shaking her head. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's enough for now. That's plenty. But, Miss Chen, would you do me a huge favor? Would you take hold of Heather's hand, and you mentioned the word love, would you give her a sensation somewhere in her body of what you're talking about, love, so that she can feel that and express what that feels like? Oh, now she's laughing. <laughs> oh, she thinks this is really funny. Um, oh, okay. Well, I got to tell you, I'm um, in an air-conditioned room uh, because all the equipment in here and... I'm getting a sensation I can only describe as what it feels like if you take niacin and you get a flush. Uh, I feel like I'm, uh, I don't know, five degrees hotter from the inside okay. out. I understand like a, a, like a, a rush of, uh, of a sensation of rush. Like a flush, I yes. think they call it. Yes, and so then it- goosebumps, now goosebumps all over. Oh, excellent. Very good. Miss Chen, we love that. Very good. A sensation. Now, this is unique to you, Heather. This is not a sensation anybody listening in is going to feel goosebumps. But And maybe, maybe they will. I don't know. But this sensation is her way of letting you know that you're connected to her and also to let you know that they're always with you. They're always keeping an eye on you. They're always helping guide you. So no matter how stressful or difficult your life becomes, ever, they're always there to hold on to you, to hold you up, to greet you upon your return. And it's not just for me. This is for everyone. Every soul has this, uh, is the understanding. Now, I, 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 I don't know how to quite make this clear to listeners right now. But there's information, nonverbal information also. Um, mm-hmm. And the sense that I'm getting is, no, this is not just for one per. This is everybody has this. And Good. people that feel right. like they're alone are never alone. Yes, I was I was actually trying to trying to include everybody in that thought. And but I. And, and it, whatever's nonverbal, whatever you can say about it, whatever the feeling is, is there anything that anybody in your council or your guide wants to impart in this unusual method of us communicating directly with people on the flip side? 
Don't stay with the pain. Don't stay with the pain. That's a wonderful sentence to hold on to. When I was visiting with my guides, my counsel, and having this bizarre mind's eye thing, what you're having right now, this experience, something that was new to me, I asked, is there any sentence that you can give me that I can pass along to people in this work? And the answer was just let go. And it relates to what you just said, which is let go of pain, let go of anger, let go of fear, let go of resentment, let go of things that you hold on to that have no use or no love for you or, you know, can help you find unconditional love. So, and is there anybody there that can help with a sensation of unconditional love? Give that to Heather. Oh, now they've all stood up. And, oh, wow. Well, this is a very strange sensation. Uh, this is a very, very strange feeling. Um, and it's almost, uh, it almost feels like now. Now, I'm in a room with nobody, okay? There's nobody here. And now <laughs> well, suddenly I feel like there's a, a bunch of people here. And the temperature the in the room feels like it's gone up just a little bit. Wow. Uh, it's generally kind of cold in here. I joke around and call it the meat locker because it's so cold, but it is not cold right now. Wow. Um, so they're giving you a sensation, which is what I asked for, a sensation of unconditional love. They're letting you know they're with you, all of them, all 12. We can go through, through each one. We can walk up to each one, ask them their name. Now, in terms of Miss Chen, she was carrying the book. And she seems to be like the spokesperson for the group. But each person in your council, you earned. If you have a large council, that means you've, learned, you've earned each person on the seat at the table. They might represent a different spiritual evolvement, like courage, like um, comedy even, like uh, different ideas that we have here on Earth of what we learn over many lifetimes, like graduating from a university class in a specific, um, you know, uh, medical science. The same thing you get awarded there. So your counsel, now take a look at Miss Chen. Is she wearing any jewelry or is she wearing anything other than that robe? Mm, you know, I see uh, where there's s certain areas, like her ears have a sparkle. There's a sparkle on her neck. There's sparkles on her hands, but I don't see jewelry. So let me ask her, is, if am I correct in what I'm saying that each one of the council members represents something and if so what does she represent in terms of your journey courage thank you lovely courage and and that's something that she was able to overcome that heather was able to overcome in a lifetime that's for this lifetime oh very good thank you and so she gave, she had the courage so would you miss chen if you don't mind Put into Heather's mind how you think she's doing now and if this is important work for her to be doing. Mm. <laughs> Almost the same answer as before. Uh, she didn't want to, but now that she's doing this, yes. <laughs> okay. A little Very slow good. for our taste, but yes. <laughs> no worries. Of course, at this point, I usually ask them to give me lottery numbers. <laughs> because it's my little joke. And I got to tell you, once when I was in the middle of doing one of these sessions, and I said, lottery numbers, please. And suddenly, you know, this person started giving me numbers. So I, I raced out, and I played the lottery, and I won a, a dollar. <laughs> I played a dollar, and I won a dollar. And it was like, oh, shit. And then I heard Whoops. this voice in my head say, not very specific, were you? <laughs> oh gosh, be, just be careful there. There's no bad language on the program, but uh wow, you know, this is really really odd odd experience. Um it is so strange. I almost feel it it it, it feels like I'm in two places at once almost. Um and at, at once I 
you know, so I'm here talking to you on the air, Richard. Uh, like also, visually, you're, you're in deep space or somewhere or y- somewhere. Yes, yes. Is and this, and let, you, let's ask Ms. Chen, is this space that we're in now, is this part of our universe or is this in another realm? When it's time for you, this is where you'll come. Okay, very good. Um, okay, good answer. <laughs> And, you know, but I I must say this to you because I've done this, uh, you know, with a few people who have had near-death experiences. And because this is so unusual to walk back into the experience that they had, which was so profound, I had a woman tell me that um, it took her two days to sort of reacclimate back to the planet. You will. You will come back. <laughs> but I, I just want to point out to your audience this place is accessible to all of us. Sometimes we dream about it. Sometimes we experience it. Sometimes we don't. You know, I, I, I did a uh, session with a medium. I work with Jennifer uh, Schaefer here in Los Angeles, um, and she's a medium who, who works for the FBI. And so I've done this thing now where once a week we sit down, I film her, and I say, who wants to talk to us? And we talk to people on the flip side where I interview them with questions like, what do we look like to you? What's it, what's the experience like for you? Oh, that and is I, I just... get these. It's fascinating because again, <laughs> it's new information. It's not what I would have imagined, but you know, I, the answers are always fun, funny and, and, you know, unconditional love is the key. Well, uh, that is a perfect note to take a break on, Richard. Uh, let us take another break here. I think I need a minute to sort of reorient. That was a strange, strange experience, everybody. But a lot of fun, and we'll be right back. Well, it's one thing to talk about these things. It's quite another to actually experience it live on the air. I got to confess, Richard, I feel a little bit naked in front of the class right now. Uh, <laughs> having done that. But, you know, I woke up today uh, feeling a little bit drained and a little bit tired. And I kind of have fought that feeling all day. And now that's why I played that song just now, because I feel energized, like I've just been struck by lightning or something. Well, that's that's great. And, you know, like I say, I think it's important for your audience to know that we didn't plan on taking a trip like this. This is just something that's random. And I also, it's important to sort of allow that, that I, it's not like I understand why we could get anywhere. And I had no idea that you would get anywhere, but we did. We got somewhere. And I tried to point out the new information along the way, which is, you know, stuff that, that you weren't aware of or that you wouldn't have conceived of until I asked you, you know, point blank, what is, what is this or what do you look like? Those kinds of things. Um, you know, the the whole idea of doing hypnotherapy, which is something I've been studying for a while, is to access this between lives realm. And then, like I say, for some reason, I just started um, maybe about a year ago with friends, you know, saying, well, let's just, you know, let's try to examine that dream you had. And the same series of questions, because I'm very open to whatever the answers might be. I mean, I try not to judge whatever somebody says, especially when they're feeling it, you know, the sensation of it. That's one thing, you know, people can make up stories, but it's very difficult to make up feelings. Um, when you have a sensation of experiencing something. I mean, Meryl Streep, maybe, you know, Robert De Niro, possibly. But most people can't access that kind of thing. And when you feel the hand of your relative or somebody who passed away, a loved one, when you're, you actually have that, only you know what that feels like. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Only you know what that feels like when you're hugging somebody that, is no longer on the planet, but you remember what it was like to hug them. Or when they say something funny to you that you don't expect. You You're know. right. Like, why didn't you do this before? <laughs> yeah, what, what took you so long? I mean, what a funny thing to say. If if you were constructing an imaginary scenario, you know, that would not be a sentence you'd throw into your spirit guide. You'd have him saying something like, you know, it's very deep and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the fact that he has a sense of humor with you, 
um, is wonderful. And, uh, and also, you know, they obviously treat you like an equal because they converse with you that way. They don't, you know, they are talking to you like uh, right. you're a student, <clears throat> they're kind of talking to you like, you know what you're doing and we're glad to be part of your team. Yeah, that's helping right. you do that. Wait, and can anybody do what we just did? Can anyone do that? Well, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> All I could say is, you know, it's like we talked about this earlier. You know, where's the class? You know, where's the university where you can learn how to do this stuff? I don't know. This isn't part of the Michael Newton curriculum. By the way, if somebody wants to try hypnotherapy, I recommend uh, the Newton Institute because they have a searchable da- database. They have, I think, about 200 active members right now and the last I spoke to them about it, they've had they've done thousands and thousands and thousands of cases worldwide. And then they have all kinds of practitioners, people who be psychiatrists, people who all walks of life who who feel called to this and and you know, so it's so that's one way of doing it is like sitting in a hypnotherapist chair. Mm-hmm. But th- there are people who can't get there or they can afford it, you know, because it does cost money to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I talked to them about Tibetan meditations because in my studies of somebody sent a note to your producer and they said, I hope Rich talks about secret um, Tibetan meditations, <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> um, but, but to, uh, you know, they're not a secret. It's just that the word secret was the word mistranslated. It, it would just means oral tradition. So teacher would pass along to student, you know, some kind of a, a deep, profound lesson, and they would do it orally. But eventually that word just became secretly. And so it, people thought they were secret meditations or secret things. But the Tibetans are widely open about their technique. In terms of what they do, generally, you know, they have been studying consciousness for a long, long time. And so they're they're very adept at meditation techniques. They don't really talk about what the afterlife. I know that there's the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but that was really written by one monk, mm-hmm. even though thousands of monks have commented on it. And what I try to point out is that was one monk's experience going into the afterlife. Newton had 7,000 monks, you know, that he talked to. And Helen Wamba had 2,000. I've had 35. Their reports are consistent. They're contrary to what the one monk said, because at some point the one monk said, you know, between lives we float around like a wisp of smoke, and based on our karma, then we return to life, you know, as a higher or lesser being, you know, they would consider animals lesser and humans higher. And this is just not in any of the research I've been doing. People consider all life sacred. There is no lesser life. I had a discussion once with a former Tibetan monk who said, you know, why would I be born HIV positive in Africa and poverty? You know, unless, and I said, well, which one of those concepts is a pejorative? None of those are negative. In fact, what people say over there is people choose more difficult lives because they're older souls, because they feel like they can handle it. So choosing a difficult life, let's just use this as a construct. I come to you and I say, Barbara, we're between lives. We're hanging out with our friends. We're having fun. We're talking to Mr. Chow and Ms. Chen. <laughs> and I say, now look, Heather, I need you to come back to this planet but you're only going to live for six years and you're just going to be living in poverty. It's going to be flies. There's going to be a lot of flies all the time. But remember we talked about the relativity of time here. Yes. It's going to feel like 10 minutes to you, but it's going to be a lot of flies and you're going to be, you know, but you're going to teach a lesson in love to these doctors who are going to fall in love with you and take care of you and be traumatized when you die. But they're going to learn what that feels like. Can you do it? And many people would say, no, I I don't like flies. But some people, older souls, say, yeah, I can handle that. I think I can handle that. And they'll come and and experience that because once they get off stage, they go back home. So when you ask, can anybody access this information? First, you've got to put your mind in this kind of weird place to consider that nobody dies, that we leave the planet, we leave the stage, however we leave, we drop our costumes, we put the props down, 
we go back home and, you know, we came here for a reason and we learn what those reasons were and we experience that. We get applause or we get booze or whatever we get from our loved ones back there. And if you can put your mind around that that's a possibility, then you can start to say, okay, well, how can I access why I came here? What I Here's what I do. I say to people, think about the most significant person you know on the planet or think of the first conscious thought you had when you were going to do whatever it is you're going to do. I asked this to an FBI agent, and she said, well, preschool. I said, really? She said, yeah, in preschool I kept lists on everybody, what they wore to school. She had a conscious thought when she was in you know, preschool that she was going to be an FBI agent. I was talking to a doctor today. He said, second grade. He said, I wanted to become famous and drive in a big Rolls Royce and be a doctor. I said, okay, well, (laughs) you know, how's that working out for you? But you can point to that first conscious thought of, you know, doing what you're going to be doing as an example of these lifetime memories. And if you do any work, like Carol Bowman wrote a number of books about children's past lives, mm-hmm. many people have, including me. I mentioned some of that in Flipside, where children talk about remembering their lifetime. When you examine those cases, now try to apply it to yourself. Why did I choose my parents? And just allow that to be a sentence. I know it's very stressful for a lot of people when I ask them that. They look at me like, what, are you crazy? Um, I, I ran into a woman uh, out sitting outside Starbucks crying the other day. And I said, are you okay? And I sat down. What's the matter? And she said, I I can't. It's too hard. She said, "Um, my dad is back on crack again. Oh, no. I said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Um, Why did you choose him? She looked at me like, what? What are you talking about? I said, well, just uh, pretend for a second that this is a real question and there's an answer. Why did you choose your father? And she said, I guess... So I would never be like him. So I could learn what not to behave like. I could learn how not to be as a human. I said, well, then you chose pretty well, didn't you? She looked at me. And then I said, you know, I explained a little bit about how people consistently say that we choose our lifetime. We choose these difficult roles so we can learn from them, so we can teach in the future or learn from these people or teach them something. And and then then I said, you know, it's. I've talked to a lot of people in my life, and I've never heard anybody say that sentence. My dad is back on crack. And she laughed. And I said, okay, my mission is accomplished. <laughs> we were able to look at life from that sobbing tear thing to, wow, what an unusual choice that I made. It also empowers people because when you stop being the victim of events that happened to you, and you start to see them from possibly that you orchestrated or designed or participated in the design of these things that are happening in your life to learn lessons because, hey, we're going to get off stage eventually. Once you come to that conclusion that there nothing can happen to you because your crowd of your council is waiting for you, and once you get back there... It's pretty cool, and you're still you, and they can see you if you're peach or red or green or blue or whatever that color is. That's you exists, exists back there, and they can see you and hang out with you, and, and, you know, you can plan the next journey here. That's not to mitigate pain in any way, Um, you know, especially in light of the tragedy just this past week. It's odd. I must tell you, the last time I was talking on the radio, somebody was right after Orlando. Oh, my God. But it's odd that when I come on to talk about this stuff, of course, people are, it doesn't mitigate pain or loss in any way. And it doesn't make that pain or loss uh, all right. It doesn't mean that it's uh, perfectly all right to spread pain and loss around. True. But, But, for example, there was a woman who came to one of my talks, and she came up to me at the coffee break and said, how dare you? say that the murder of my daughter might have been planned by her. Now, I understand that. And I said, listen, it's a coffee break, but let me ask you, has she ever appeared to you since then? And she said, a couple of times I felt her presence. I said, okay, now think how difficult it is for her to reach out to you to let you know she's okay. 
because you're so emotionally distraught. She said, okay. And I said, would she want you to live your life sad or happy? She said, happy. I said, was she a happy person? She was very happy. I said, okay, well then honor her. You may not know the reason why this happened, but you can honor her memory by living for her in a positive, loving, helpful way. It doesn't take away the loss, but it allows you to go on with your life. And this woman came to my book talk like a month later, and I saw her in the back of the room, and I went over. I said, how you doing? She said, I just wanted to come down here, look you in the eye, and say thank you for saving my life. Wow. And, you know, in that moment, I thought, <laughs> I'm never going to get a review like that for any movie I ever do. So, you know, again, it's not me. I'm not saving her life. It's the research. It's what these people are saying consistently. And as a scientist, you have to put the data on the table and let the data speak to you. Try not to judge what it is. You could argue, oh, this is, you know, you're somehow con- leading people or, you know, but in the journey that you and I just went on, I didn't come up with any of those images you or any of those thoughts. No, you weren't leading me. In fact, I had the same thoughts of, uh, that you had about your own experience. I went, oh, great. Now, what is this going to do? Nothing is going to happen and it's going to ruin the show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah, and nothing is happening. Uh, but there definitely were things things happening. Yeah, yeah. I have, we had no idea. And believe me, I sat with people who look at me like, I, you know, I, I'd tell you, but I'd be making it up. And I say, well, just whatever comes to mind. You know, try not to judge it. We're not, we're not on a game show here. You don't win points or lose points if you say what comes into your mind. So in, in your case, when you listen back to this, you know, or a transcript from it, you'll see a point where you say, oh, this is weird. Here's what I'm seeing, you know, and it's not something that you could have constructed. It's something that somebody else or your deep subconscious is constructing. I don't know, but it's okay. Well, what fascinates me about the whole thing is that, well, we were talking about hypnosis earlier and, you know, I wasn't completely gone. I was, I was, Absolutely still awake and conscious and able, because, I mean, let's face it, I have equipment to run over here to run yeah, the okay. show. Hello. Um, Hello. And I have to watch the clock and make sure I hit the brakes and all those things. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I was able to access this other place. Uh, and And you know how I recognized that place? I recognized it by the feeling, that feeling of home. Because mm. one of the things... Um, <clears throat> that uh, that I heard or experienced during my near death experience uh, was okay. Well, you know, at some point you can't stay here forever. At some point you're going to have to go. And I said, Well, I don't want to go. It's nice here. I, w- I would like to stay right. here. This feels normal and this feels right. Um, going back to Earth, ah, gosh, it's so hard down there. I don't want to do that. Uh, I, nothing I do <laughs> works, you know, and it's so difficult. Right. And that's how I recognized that somehow, some way, we were able to tap into that place because I felt that sensation of home uh, again. And it's so hard to describe um, unless no, a person's I, 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 experienced it. No, it's uh, absolutely. And I, I'm fond of saying home. The word home is a great example because it means something different to everybody. It means something different to twins. When you ask somebody, what what does home mean to you? They have a visual and an image. And then you say, well, what's the sensation of home? And they'll say a feeling of comfort, a feeling of unconditional love, a feeling of non-judgment. You said one of the words. Uh, it was that feeling of comfort or contentment. Yes. And the idea that that, you know, we could all argue what that means you know, it means something different to each one of us, but we all can agree that we know when someone's talking about home, I had the feeling of home. Now, from, a, you know, from a disassociated uh, point of view, we might say, well, you know, they're talking about home. I mean, of course, that, you know, I had somebody say, of course, people are going to talk about home. That is the most logical place. And I think, no, it's not. Because when somebody says, I feel like I'm home, the first time I heard it, I thought, Schenectady? Like, this woman's from New York. I mean, what does she mean home? 
you know, and then I, when I said I, w- I just want to go home as a Native American, I, I was like, what do I mean, Northbrook? Mm-hmm. What's home? Mm-hmm. A- and and I, I realized in that moment I didn't mean here. I meant somewhere else, not here, not on this planet, you know, not in this realm. And as your guide said, you know, because we asked, like, well, where are you? <laughs> and your guide said, I'm where you're going to be. When you get here, which is hilarious, (laughs) if you think about it. I mean, you know, come on. How clever is that? Like, I'm not going to give you coordinates because, you know, you might invade. I don't know. But, you know, (laughs) listen, and I try to leave levity in here because this is just the nature of reality. We don't have to take it so seriously that we can't talk about it. We can't have some fun with it. And we can also appreciate, you know, what we're doing here. Like, and I've had this uh, conversation with a number of near-death people. I speak at the IONS group sometimes. Oh, cool. And I have, an, I have a number of videos at Martini Prod on YouTube, where I, like 20 or 30, where I, I speak at the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And I've heard many people say, I don't want to come here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be back. I had, a, I loved it so much being back there. Why do I have to be back here? You know, and you can't say, well, it's in your contract. <laughs> you cannot read it. <laughs> you know, and you can't say, but just recently, I was just doing this last week with Jennifer Schaefer, uh, filming her and talking to somebody on the flip side, talking to Luana, actually. And I said to Luana, who showed up, we were talking to somebody who had just passed away and asking questions about, you know, why did you check out and blah, 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 what happened. And Luana came forward and I said, so Lou, what is it you miss about being here? And she said, well, you can't, over there, everything's a construct, right? Everything's created. So you can't really strum a guitar. You can you can create music and hear music, fantastic music, but you physically can't do that. You can't hug a tree, for example. You can hug a tree, but when you get close to the tree, you realize it's an energetic thing, mm-hmm. you know, that that's kind of spongy. This is what people describe. So things can, I know it sounds weird, but, you know, if you like cappuccino, if you like pizza, you can create these things, but it's not the same. So if you think for a moment, oh, here's what she said. She said, she reminded Jennifer of a day that we were in my convertible together, my friend Luan and I, and the top was down, and, and we were driving, and her hair was flying all over her face. And she said, that sensation, you can't get over here. <laughs> so when you think about the things on the planet you love the most, the touch of someone's hand, the, the generosity of heart, uh, a kiss, a tear, Things that are so tactile and wonderful and a sunset, you know, a sunrise, music, a concert, Mm -hmm. playing. These things, they aren't there. They're echoes over there and they can feel it there. But, you know, I'm just saying there's a lot to be said for being here. Well, there is. There is. There's a a strong sense of not necessarily needing anything in that other place. Um, But I I find that. that here on earth in this waking world here on earth, Um, I find it just a little bit more exciting because there's the highs and the lows. There's you don't know what's going to happen next, right? right? That sensation. I like that sensation. Uh, But there on that other place, you don't feel that. It's just everything is okay and that's perfectly fine. Um, but, But here there's a very it's very, very different um, between the well, places. Two, two, two quick examples. One is I heard somebody say, you can learn more from one day of tragedy on Earth than you can from 5,000 years on some boring planet where nothing <laughs> happens. And I thought, okay, all right, I get that. But the other thing was I had a friend, uh, she's a film producer, skeptic, just didn't didn't believe in any of this stuff I was telling her. But she said, look, I, I'm having an operation, and they told me that hypnotherapy might be good, you know, for the recovery. She said, oh, so I'm going to try it. I said, okay, well, if you get somewhere, what would you like to ask? She said, I don't know. I'm not going to ask anything. And so we came up with three questions. Um, they were, is the universe a machine? 
That was her scientific question. She said, what's the meaning of a shift in consciousness? Because everybody was talking about it. What does that mean? And then she said, what or who is God? Mm-hmm. So those were her three questions. Those I thought, are, oh, pretty good. Those you know, are very, questions. very good questions. Yeah. Um, can we talk about the answers to those questions when we come yeah, back? Yeah, when we come back. All yeah, right. absolutely. All right, perfect. <laughs> that is absolutely perfect. Boy, this is fun tonight. I'm having a hell of a time uh, with Richard Martini tonight on the program. So... Everybody go get a refill and uh, come right back to the same exact place. We'll be right back, everybody. Well, my guest tonight is Richard Martini, if you're just tuning in. And we're talking about something that none of us really know that much about, right? We're talking about that space, that place between lives, wherever it is we go before we come back onto this earth. It is a fascinating conversation. I'm having a great time with Richard, who I'm going to get to in in just a second here, but there's a wormhole message that I also want to get to. I don't know. This just hit a nerve with me, I guess. Uh, This comes from Bruce in Michigan. And Bruce says, will we remember every negative thing we've done in this life, in our next life? I've frequently sought forgiveness in my spiritual tradition, yet I'm haunted daily by bad things that I've done in this life. Uh, now, Bruce, I want to talk to you about this for a second. Um, I can only I can only talk to you about this from my own experience, and maybe we'll hear from Richard on this also. Um, but I can tell you, you well, what happened to me was I had the life review, and it fe- it, it, it seems very quick. Right. So once you have the life review, you feel every emotion that you've ever sort of given another living thing. And that includes animals. So you have that life review. You feel all the joy, all the pain that you've ever, I guess, for lack of a better word, inflicted on another soul. Right. And then after that, after that, you don't stay in that place. You don't stay in a place of regret. Uh, For me, what happened was then I started to figure out, well, how can I act differently? How can I live my life differently so that I don't cause the pain that I have before? Um, So you move on from it and you try to figure out what to do so that you don't do that again. Uh, But as far as going all the way to that other place and, and then having your life review and, and visiting with the council and then you design a new life to come to on earth and then you come into that new life. You know, I don't know about that. Little children seem to have memories of their past lives and things that they've done. Uh, I, I haven't heard of adults uh, who still remember about the pain that they've given. So I, I hope that that is somehow helpful. Uh, and welcome back, Richard. Um, what do you think uh, about what I just said? Well, fascinating. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, I think we have a tendency to think of uh, sin. Let's just call it that, because that seems to be what he's referring to. Feel Things that feel karmically bad. You know, the word karma took on this meaning of baggage somewhere along the line. Karma just means action. So when you think about action, there's good and bad. You just pointed that out. David Bennett had a near-death experience. He wrote about it in a book called Voyage of Souls, where he saw two events. One was he was in a bar in Texas, and some guy hit on him, and he went, hey, stop hitting on me. I'm, you know, I'm not gay. And suddenly the whole bar beat up this guy. But he experienced that from being the guy, being beaten up. So that negative thing that he had done, he felt it like intensely. However, they also showed him this woman that used to come into the place where he worked. She would never smile. And he went out of his way to find a way to make her laugh and smile. He did this thing for her. And he felt the wave of of laughter and the sweetness that came from that experience throughout her world. And so it was equally as powerful So the things we don't even see or can't see or we don't think are that important actually are really important. So they do outweigh, you know, there's, we have a tendency to think the bad things we've done outweigh the good, but it's just not the case because we can't 
see the good that we've done for people on a right. consistent basis. Yeah, now, right. you did ask me, like, how to access this information. Can anybody access it? I was going to tell you a little bit. I mentioned Tibetan meditation only because meditation um, is a profound way to sort of access things that you can't access. It's also a way of doing mental push-ups, like, you know, getting your brain sort of conditioned so that you can think about things you don't normally think about. But there's very simple meditations you can do. But I've had people on the flip side tell me, don't use the word meditation because people feel like it's gymnastics, like they have to learn how to do yoga or something to meditate. I thought this was so funny, like your guide mocking you. Mm -hmm. I've heard this from people on the flip side who said, one person said, look, just have people say the name of their loved one. And I said, do they say it with their voice or do they just think it in their head? And he said, it doesn't matter. I said, so how do people, when they are imagining talking to a loved one who's passed on and asking questions, like, you know, who's my guide? Who are, where, what's my journey? Why did I choose this life? These questions. I said, how do people realize the difference between making it up, right? Which we would think that would be the case. Right. Or actually connecting and getting answers. And he said, when the answer comes to you before you formulate the question, mm-hmm. when it's that fast, you'll know that you're getting the appropriate response. I thought, okay, well, that's a very simple way for people to access without going to a hypnotherapist. And, you know, look, you, you can't just, you know, you have to pull over your car. <laughs> right. But, but let's say that you come up with 10 questions you might ask, you know, a loved one or God or someone and and write them down and and maybe take out a photograph of a loved one, somebody you love that you knew that's no longer on the planet and really focus on them as if they were still here and talk to them in present tense and see what answers you get. You know, the worst that can happen is they tell you something, you know, the lottery numbers, <laughs> then you're in <laughs> trouble, you know. But I was going to say, so back to this woman who, when she, we went to the total skeptic and we did one of these sessions, which I filmed, and it's in the book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife, where she suddenly remembered a previous lifetime where it was like 1820 and she was living in Arizona and she was a rancher. And I could look all this stuff up while she was saying it, you know, online, you know, the names of the towns that she was from and it's very strange. But so she was got a very clear and accurate memory of a previous lifetime. And at the end of that life, she was this cranky old man who had taken a young bride and then, you know, because the question is, what was your last day? And she said, well, I'm out on the buckboard with my young bride and she's asked me to go get her some water at this local creek. And then as I got out of the buckboard, she drove away and left him there to die. And then and then described the death scene, which is, you know, painful and stressful and dry. And then, at the, and then the hypnotherapist said, so now what? And she said, I see myself climbing out of this body, but I'm this like young girl and I'm dancing and I'm like hopping up and down. And he said, what's this emotion? And she said, I always wanted to be a cranky old man and I finally did it, <laughs> which is like, what? <laughs> and then she described going back to her soul group. And the re- this is the reason I mention it is because she said, my soul group, they seem like children it's really annoying they're all they're, they want me to play they're pulling my hand they want me to go play with them and scott the tamble um life between lives.com is his place but it, it, scott and i work together quite a bit so scott said to her he's a newton trained hypnotherapist scott said so what what's the game you're playing and she said it's it's tag she said but it's a version over here and the tag game is you can hide you can be invisible you're invisible and you can hide anywhere in the universe <laughs> and you have to find all six people simultaneously. And then she said, oh, wait, they're telling me the twist is you can hide in any realm. So like multiple realms, <laughs> invisible, you have to tag them all at the same time. And so my point is between lives, we're doing stuff. We're not just twiddling our thumbs, playing lutes. You know, there's classrooms. And inside these classrooms, I've had many descriptions. I've been to many of them. I visited Luana in her classroom. These classrooms, people describe these incredible um, devices or things that they're working with. And they always have to do with energy transfer. In Luana's case, she was in a classroom where they were teaching about healing techniques on the planet. 
the funny thing is, is in my session, my very first session, I found myself in a classroom. It wasn't Luana's. It was just another class. And the teacher seemed to know me. And I said, oh, I know this woman. And we were there conversing. And everyone in the class, I felt, I, you know, I teach. I'm a teacher. So I've, you know, been in many classrooms. It felt like a regular class. All these students are looking at me like, oh, this is teacher's friend. This is so cool. And, I, and the hypnotherapist said, what are they doing in this class? And, and I said, well, everybody carries around all of their past life memories in a geometric shape, a fractal. And it travels with us during our lifetime. We can't see it, but they're there. And they're, they function as remote or, um, you know, hard drives that retain all that information that can access them in times that we need to. And I said, in this classroom, she's teaching them how to clean these hard drives in between lives. Now, I don't know where that came from, but as I said it, it was like, yeah, I totally know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and and in the film flip side, I actually show an indication of like cleaning ball bearing. I said, imagine how he said to me, "What is what's what? What's the purpose of this?" And he, I said, "Think of ball bearings. Ball bearings help a machine work. Having access to previous lifetime memories is the same way ball bearings work." <laughs> I don't even know what a ball bearing is, but you know, over there I did. And then a little bit later on, I went to this other class and where I found, saw my found my friend Luana, but she was about age twenty, with a pony. I way before I met her, with a ponytail. And she's looking at me like, what are you doing here? And I, I'm speaking to the hypnotherapist, you know, just the way you were, we're in two places at the same time. Mm -hmm. Concomitants, I think they call it. And I'm standing in the classroom and I'm saying, well, this is a classroom about the healing light of the universe and how they're teaching how to channel that light into doctors down on earth who need to heal people. And one of the students in the, and the class stopped as I was talking, because it was like, oh, my God, some weird guy is talking in our class. My friend Luana was looking at me like, what are you doing? And this one student turned around and said to me, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, this is so weird. I don't, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be talking. But I said, but look, I've come a long way to get here, so <laughs> I'm going to continue talking. And I looked at the guy, and I said, yes, I understand Doctors sign up for lifetimes where they don't heal everybody. People sign up for lifetimes where they aren't cured of every disease. People sign up to experience and learn from healing and from illness. So it's not that they it, people get cured every time from people who the work in this class. And the guy looked at me like, okay, I guess you do know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then the class went on. Now, here's what's weird. Two years later, I did a session with Scott DeTamble here in Los Angeles, two years later. And he said, where do you want to go? And I thought, you know, I'll do another session and see if I go somewhere else. I went right back to the classroom where Luana was, but it was 20 minutes later. She was introducing me to the teacher that I'd interrupted. And she was saying to him, this is my friend Richard. <laughs> He's doing this unusual project on Earth, you know, interviewing people on the flip side. And he wanted to ask you some questions. And then I see this tall, like nine-foot-tall guy who says, all right, what are your questions? <laughs> and, I, and then I said, well, you know, give me a one, two, three. Like, how does it work? How do people channel healing light? And he said, well, you know, then he described it to me, you know, some kind of a process where doctors and healing people on the earth subconsciously don't see that they're calling upon this healing light. But when they go into operate or when they go into heal, they try and they try to heal, and they're calling upon that light, the healing light of the universe, to help them. I, look, I'm going to tell you, that's what he said. It's not something I understand, but I reported it. Um, anyway, and so back to my friend, you know, she had the three questions. Yes. Is the universe, so here she, she meets her guide, which she didn't think she was going to get to. She's, at the, she's describing this incredible library. Her guide is kind of a curmudgeon. His attitude is like, really? You're going to bother me with questions? I got work over here. All right, what do you want to know? He goes, is the universe a mechanism? Yes. He goes, is the universe a machine? Yes, he says. It's a mechanism. However, he said, it's sentient. Whatever that means. I went, okay. And then the second question was, what's this thing about a shift in consciousness? He said, ah, you know, in terms of the cosmos, the shift in consciousness on Earth is no big deal. I love it when people refer to things like, yeah, it's not like Saturn running into Jupiter. 
He said, but if you want to understand a shift in consciousness, imagine yourself a crab walking on the ocean floor. You open your eyes and you realize you're in an ocean. That's a shift in consciousness. I thought, wow, that's amazing because I'd always thought, you know, like trees are like lungs. You know, they look like lungs. And they give off oxygen, and lungs are the opposite. You know, they look like trees in your body, and they do the. And so I thought, you know, if, if people thought of oxygen, water, we would treat it differently. You know, we just don't. Anyway, that's a shift in consciousness. And then the question was, well, what or who is God? And now I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> and, well, naturally, we all are. I think we all are. Yeah. And he said, and this is kind of funny. He said, look. God is beyond the the physical capacity of the brain to comprehend. It's just not physically possible, he said. However, you can experience God. And at that moment, I thought, oh, I get what he's saying. You know, it's like too much information for a computer. It just freezes up. You know, it just it can't work. Mm -hmm. But you can experience something like I was talking to somebody who had never been in a swimming pool, a guy from South Africa, a bushman. And I was trying to say, have you been swimming in this pool? And he was like, what are you talking about? He was like, you jump in the pool. And you know, I realized it was a concept he wasn't familiar with. And trying to describe it, you know, there are no words. You just got to do it. And once you jump in a pool, you know what that feeling is like. So here this guy is saying, you can't comprehend God too difficult. But you can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. And I thought it was interesting he added to all things, meaning, you know, everything has a purpose and a place. A tree has a purpose and a reality and an energy to it. Everything that's in our world has a purpose and a place and a re- the solar system is a system it's not just that one planet's important they all affect each other they're all part of this system our bodies are the system you know that that is in- inherently and the soul is a system you know we're all connected so the idea that if you open your heart unconditional love to everyone and all things you can experience home you can experience what god is and it occurred to me that i said this a little earlier if you think of god as an ocean or home as an ocean right the water huge body of water Mm -hmm. each individual lifetime is like being you know a body of water like in a glass or in a pond or whatever it is at the end of that life you leave the glass, you leave the pond, go back to the ocean. While you're in the glass, it's very hard to know what the ocean is like because you're in the glass and your whole reality is inside that glass. And once you go back, ah, there we are. I'm back and part of this ocean again. I understand it. I see. Oh, I used to be, I was a mo- I'm a molecule, but I'm with all these other molecules. We can all experience things. We're all composed of the same thing. So if you think about Opening your heart to everyone, very difficult to do, almost impossible. Well, the guy yeah, because standing on your foot, pointing a gun at you. Yes, thank you. That's what I was just thinking of. If I'm going to open my heart to everything and everyone, that means I'm also opening up my heart to those out there that are evil. Okay, so here's the point. If you open your heart to everyone... Then you see everything that happens on stage as part of the stage play, as part of the journey on stage. Once they get back off stage, then you can ask them, why did you do this act? What was the purpose of it? Why did you have this journey? And they can tell you. It may not make sense to you, but you haven't been in their shoes. Well, and I recently heard a fantastic quote from Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, and, and it was very simple. He said, look, the universe is not obligated to make sense to you. (laughs) <laughs> and I love well, that. That's true. <laughs> well, also what he pointed out is that every rainbow is only a rainbow to the person viewing it. So their experience of a rainbow is different for each person because of the angle and the degree and where you are. Mm-hmm. We can all talk about rainbows, but each rainbow is different for each person, just the way home is. 
And so I'm just fond of saying, you know, when you have this word evil, right, which we understand, and we understand here on the earth is something is not we want to participate with or be around or, or but from from stage participation place, from sitting in the audience, I can tell you as a screenwriter, I got to write the bad guy. Someone's got to play that part. And I cast and I think about the person who's going to play the best part. And then I think about how bad they could be. And then I think more worse things because I'm trying to make money or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It's not that undifferent. It's not that undifferent. Not that different in terms of what people claim about choosing their lifetime. Now, I'll give you an example. This is a difficult one, but it's the first thing I encountered in this research. There I was in Chicago filming Michael Newton, and they said, well, we're going to let you film a between-life session. Do you mind? I was like, great. Paul Orend, who former president, conducted the session. It's in the movie Flipside, and it's in the book. Mm-hmm. This woman remembered a lifetime as a Holocaust victim. She remembered dying in Auschwitz. And at first, my my brain couldn't get my mind around, oh, sure, come on, Nazis, this is too convenient. I'm filming this, and now she's remembering dying in Auschwitz. I, it was too much. But as she went back into the between lives realm and saw her loved ones and her soulmates and everybody else, all the people she knew and loved, eventually she got to her council. And standing in front of her council, she said plaintively, why did I choose this lifetime? I lost everything. I lost everyone. And by the way, I was able to find this woman in the Book of Records of Auschwitz, Anna Paczynski. I lost everyone and everything. Why did I choose this life? And her guides said, well, she said, they're showing me images. I know this is going to be hard to hear, but they're showing me images that it was harder to choose to play the role of a perpetrator in this life than a victim. When I heard that, my brain froze. I, my eye shot back from the camera. I was like, what? Where am I? What is this? And then I heard it. She said, look, every day in the camp was intense lesson in courage, an intense lesson in forgiveness and love, an intense lesson that most people can't sign up for. I know I couldn't. But people who did sign up for it, had the courage to sign up for that lesson because it taught lessons to other people as well. And so when you look at it from that angle, and I've consistently heard this from people who have been murdered in previous lifetimes where between lives they go, oh my God, he's showing me, he's saying to me that you have no idea how hard it was to do that to you in this lifetime, but you asked me to do it. It was the contract you asked me to fulfill so you could experience that. In Newton's book, Memories of the Afterlife, there's a a woman who remembers a life as a Nazi guard who shot and killed his fiancée, who was a Jewish woman, and in between lives sees himself, him herself, going back to her soul group, and out of the soul group comes this woman that he shot, and she holds his hands and says, don't you remember, this is what we agreed to experience together in this lifetime. My God. I know that's hard for people to wrap their minds around. Again, I'm not, this isn't a belief. It's not a philosophy. I am just reporting what people consistently say. And it, and it's across all cultures, all religions, all backgrounds, all genders. I've talked to people from all religions that I can, atheists, agnostics, it doesn't matter. Once they get back and talk into their soul group and their council, they understand the most difficult lessons of why they chose their lifetime. Well, really, think about that question. Okay, so you're in the space between lives, and you're given a choice. Are you going to be a perpetrator of evil, or are you going to be a survivor of evil? Uh, Just think about, or or a a victim victim of evil. Try Try to imagine making that decision. I think I would probably go the victim route, too. And as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about horrible things that have happened to me in my life, and yet... Yes, it is very difficult to think that I made those agreements sometime uh, before I I got here. But can I just say you're the first person I think I've spoken to who's had twelve people on a council? Wow, really? I've I have eight. I've met the eight people on my council. 
you get more people on your council the more that you've taught and learned and suffered and gone through. And so I have to say, congratulations, my dear. (laughs) You have gone very far as your soul. Wow. And you're doing a great job helping people on the planet. That sure is a lot to think about, everybody. And, you know, I want to hear what all of you are thinking about. Let's open up the phone lines when we come back, all right? That's what we'll do. I'm Heather Wade. Well, that just seemed to be the perfect song for this moment, right? Well, I want to know what all of you think about all of this, everything that Richard Martini and I have been talking about tonight. What do you think? Is this resonating with you? Do you have an experience that you can uh, interject into the conversation tonight? Well, I want to hear from all of you out there. Get out those telephonic devices, manipulate them, and join the conversation tonight. Uh, I do want to remind everybody, you can call the program with Skype if you have it. Uh, if you're in North America, it's real easy. we got two Skype lines to get into the program. So if you're in North America, you're going to want to search for MITD11. That's how you'll find me. And if you're not in North America, wherever you may be on this planet or elsewhere, then you just type in MITD21 and you put that right into the Skype search bar itself and hit search and you will find me and I don't have to add you as a contact. Just hit the call button once you find me and I definitely want to hear from you tonight. Um, And uh, maybe I can even get us started with a question from the wormhole. And welcome back, Richard. Um, You know, I wanted to add to what I was just saying before the break. If if those bad things had not happened to me, I would not be the person that I am today. So, you know, in the moment when horrible things are happening to you, you don't really care about the explanation. You don't care about a lesson. You're just, well... I can speak about myself. I'm just angry that this horrible thing is happening to me. But if you look at it and you look at how your life unfolds and where it ends up, I mean, I I can only speak for myself. But if those things hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here today and I wouldn't be the person that I am had I not uh, been through some of those things. Had I not had a near-death experience, I'd probably be treating people the same way I did before the near-death experience. I never thought it mattered how we treat each other. And it turns out that is what it's all about. I'm fond of saying the stones that are in your path, once you traverse them or go beyond them, when you look back at them, they they turn to diamonds because you know that's you learned that lesson you've mastered it you've gone forward as a result of it and it's you know like you say it's really almost impossible to experience that while you're in the throes of the suffering or pain or whatever it is mm-hmm. but but it does it once you can sort of put your mind around it that you start to see things like for example when i said you know, older souls choose difficult lives. I mean, generally. Mm-hmm. So you see a homeless person, and and maybe now you don't look at them as like somebody who's in your way, but somebody who's like an avatar who has chosen a really difficult path, whatever it is, a physical ailment, a mental ailment. I've had these conversations, of course, me. I, I will stop people in the street and say, so why do you think you chose this life? You know, and I was talking to one guy, like, bent oh, terribly over. And it said, I said, looks like you have scoliosis. He said, yeah, I do. I don't know how you knew that. But, you know, I, my parents loved me unconditionally. And he looked me right in the eye. He said, and I chose them because of that. So there's nothing that can happen to me that, that is beyond that love. And I thought, wow, you know, what a... What a lesson that you know, to learn. I mean, it's fantastic when somebody can come across it and learn it. You know, usually we don't really hear about lessons people learn until we're at the eulogy, you know. Right. When they say, you know, they went through this difficult thing, but I think at the end they learn. But I, I'm a fan of looking at um, hospice accounts of what people say, their last words on the planet. Um, you know, Steve Jobs, his last words were, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, as reported by his sister. And, um, you know, I think that's because he was seeing things that aren't of this realm, but experiencing them as he left 
this realm. Um, Napoleon, you know, he was he acted like he was reporting for duty. He like gave his rank and name and serial number, and the last thing he said was Josephine. You know, he saw he saw the love of his life. Wow. So I think. You know, when you start to look at these things, not from that jaded view of, you know, well, whatever it is, even the scientific stuff. There's a wonderful um, talk by uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson on YouTube for free. It's an hour long. It's called Is Consciousness Produced by the Brain? And it's scientific cases that he cites where, like in England, where people had Alzheimer's just prior to passing and the way he put it was like an hour, sometimes a week, maybe a month prior to passing, they suddenly regained their memory and were able to have conversations with people and say goodbye. I reproduced that in It's a Wonderful Afterlife that, that we, I interviewed him about this topic. But he said it's as if the brain, which they've done autopsies on people after they've died, and there's no reason they should have been able to remember anything. But it's as if the filters that keep this information from our brain had died with the brain. And so they were able to access memories of loved ones, of, you know, the reason they were on the planet. You know, they have really profound conversations with their loved ones before they pass. So these are things you can actually look up, you know, where scientists talk about them. It's not just me and Heather. Right. About. Oh, yeah. No, it is not just us. Uh, and, and I've had, you know, Dr. Jeff Long on the program talking about his oh, right, work sure. and uh, and a lot. I know it may not sound like like it relates, but a lot of what we're talking about reminds me of something that Dr. Albert Taylor said one time. Uh, you know, he talks a lot about out of body travel and astral travel and this sort of thing. Uh But he says that that's our soul's work. And if you you do enough of this soul work, what you end up with is finding out who you really are and what we really are. And so this work, to me, seems to parallel that. Because if we're going to study what the life between lives, what that space or that place is like, then that's figuring out who we really are and what we really are. And I can't well, think of anything more profound or important than that. I totally agree. And but in my case, I, I started to ask myself, what the heck? What am I doing? You know, I had, I had this film career. Like, why am I focused on this? And I realized at some point, if it's true what people are saying, you know, that we do choose our lives and we do come back here, then doesn't it make sense to leave behind a planet that has fresh water, fresh air, fresh food, fresh earth? for not only our children's lives, but our possible return here. Doesn't it make sense? Like, wouldn't you want to be able to come back here and, and, you know, drink a glass of water, fresh water? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and because people have a tendency to think of the journey as a one-way ticket and that when you pass away, that's it. And, you know, maybe you'll be punished and maybe you'll, you know, fly in a cloud. But wait a second, you know, you're in charge of this reality as well. And you can lay the groundwork for future generations, including you, including your loved ones. So I think that's why it's so important to address this, because if it's true what these people are saying, it it will upend every system that we have. Education, the prison system, the whole idea of prison being a place where you punish people. It's funny, in, in Amsterdam, they're actually doing sessions with hypnotherapists that come in and speak to the people who are not getting out, you know, the the lifers. But they're getting to access why they chose this lifetime. And it's profoundly changing them because now they see life from a completely different aspect. It, it doesn't really make sense to have execution of somebody when you're just giving them a f- ticket home. You're giving them an early ticket home. I mean, doesn't it make more sense to have them stick around and take care of lost animals, take care of pets? Or uh, I, I once did a um, some scene for Charles Grodin's show in Wallkill. It's a prison in upstate New York. And this guy was telling me they take care of thoroughbred horses that have been you know, put out to pasture. And he said, I have never taken care of a creature or a human being in my life. And now this horse depends on me. So he learned this profound lesson while incarcerated. So I'm just pointing out that 
we tend to, we have a tend to think you know we tend to see to think of things in this way we've always thought of them and what if it's true that we're here to learn lessons and if somebody has to be put away because they're violent or whatever their their purpose was on planet but why not have them learn more lessons while they're still here you see instead of executing them it doesn't make any sense because mm-hmm. oh. that's just a revenge issue and and then you also go uh, in it's a wonderful life there's an attorney who reached out to me she said that she represents second degree murderers people you know run over people with drunk driving she said in all of her cases over 30 years every one of her clients had a visitation either a dream or a physical manifestation of their victim coming to them and saying some version of, I'm okay, and I can help you. And needless to say, she couldn't tell the court, she couldn't tell the parents, or the you know the victim's relatives, but all of her clients had had this experience. And I started looking it up online, I found a case in Seattle where this guy had terrible murder, but in the courtroom he said, your family came to me and said, we're okay, and we can help you. <laughs> so don't don't kill me because I still have more work I can do here, even in prison. And one juror believed him. And so he's doing life in prison instead of being executed. Listen, I know that's controversial what I'm saying, but, but I'm just saying it's not me. It's, it's, I'm reporting it, you see? Well, let's find out then what the audience has on their mind. We'll find out. Uh, over cool. on line three, you're on the air with Richard Martini, and welcome to the program. Howdy. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I'm really enjoying this. I'm going through this as a realization in my own life. I've been talking with the people on the other side. And coming from being 73 years old and coming from an extremely fundamentalist, conservative area of the United States that was 30 years behind times when I was there, uh, it's, it's, I've, I've I've just dragged myself to the realization that all that you're saying is true. Now, what I I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, Every single soul on this planet is doing the same thing that you described. They all chose, no matter whether it's the peak of the society or the very bottom of the society, We're all doing it together, right? A whole bunch of us have made these agreements, and it's a great, big, complicated holodeck we're doing, roughly speaking, right? Yeah, that's a good example. Okay, well, now, my heart goes out to people, except I see somebody standing on the side of the road with a sign, and there's people begging, and they're able-bodied men, and I need them to go work, but they won't do that. So I don't have any sympathy for that, and they're not going to get mine because that's their choice, right? All right. Well, hold on a second. Hang on a second. Let's let's talk about the Gandhi issue. Gandhi had somebody come to him, and he was distraught because he had murdered a Muslim father, or, or because his son had been killed. He was Hindu, and then he had murdered somebody. And so he, but he was concerned because he was not, he felt that he was going to suffer in hell because of it. And so Gandhi said to him, what you should do is adopt a Muslim child, somebody whose parents have been killed, but raise him as a Muslim so that you will understand what their predicament is. So the next time that you see a homeless person that is able-bodied, Stop and talk to them. It's not going to harm you in any way. Ask them the question, so why do you think you're here? Ask them the question, so why do you think you chose this lifetime if you did? And see what they have to say. The truth is, is when you stop and... You've talked to people that are home and they say, listen, I've never met somebody that's homeless that I've talked to who didn't explain to me in detail how difficult it was to be in the position they were in. I understand that. And you have compassion. Okay. I'm, listen, I'm not looking for a value judgment on anything. I'm just saying 
I have gone through all of this, and I have been at the bottom of the heap. I've been one of them, sir. Uh huh. And uh, my point is, and I'm back up where I was. Start, you know, I'm really back up good now, and in real estate and everything. But I was at the bottom of the heap too. And and I've been contemplating this that you're discussing and describing for the last th- thirty years. And I went on a you know a seven year roam all over the United States when I got down to where I was at the bottom rung of the ladder, you know. Right. And it, it, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is that everybody out there is fulfilling their desired contract, right? All of us are, right? Correct. Correct. Sure. And part okay, of your so contract is, may, but part of, hold on one sec, but part of your contract, let's say, was to experience these highs and lows. And when you oh, see I, somebody I'm who's, on, well, hold on, hold I'm on one sec. Stepping above no, all of that. No, no, I'm but here's what I'm saying. You've, ex- you. you've experienced the roller coaster. When you see someone that's at the bottom of the roller coaster, you're just seeing them there. They may eventually get to where you are. You just can't see it. Isn't that possible? Yes, but that's not the point I'm trying to make, sir. That's not the discussion I want to have. Well, I want okay. to hear the point I, I, that you're... No, no, I, I, look, I'm just saying, I'm pointing this out from this level. If I am going to teach this like you do, and believe me, I've had just as profound an experience in my life as you have in yours. I'm talking about it from that level. I'm looking at it as a fabric and out of which, when we realize that everybody is having their own experience by their choice, we can then fit ourselves into helping them if it, if it fits into their choosing. Well, hang on, hang on. I I understand what you're saying. I understand the question. It's like everybody, if everybody's choosing their lifetime, what's the point of helping anybody? Because that's their choice. But that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Well, I'm not saying what's the point. I'm saying you must judge who you're going to try to help because of the experiences. You might just be better off to stay out of their picture. Well, it's possible. What I'm I would that only say this: that, Look, you can't. You the only choice. you have that well, analytical choice. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, I understand. And here's what I would say: the only the uh, the answer to every question is unconditional love. There is no question that unconditional love is not the answer to. If you open your heart to everyone, as we discussed, open your heart to everyone, then you will never go wrong. So if you help somebody by opening your heart to them, you can never go wrong with that. Even if they reject it, even if they ignore it, even if they they find that crazy or insane. Or if they don't deserve your heart. it. What if they don't deserve it? You open your heart yeah. anyway. But that, that 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 that's a judgment call. You can't judge somebody else's journey. Only you can judge your own journey. I see. All right. All right. Well, uh, caller, did you want to say one more thing? Yeah. Well, yeah. The whole idea wasn't um, what I'm talking about is I've come to the point where I look at it as a pretty steadily recurring experience that people are having in the lessons they're here to learn. And I agree with you about the unconditional love. That's that's the only way it'll work. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem to be working here. And I want to ask a further question. I didn't want to get into that big, big, big discussion. Here's what I wanted to ask you. All right. Sure. Now, supposedly, our solar system is on the upswing through the photon belt of the the, uh, galactic elliptic. Have you heard this? Um, that, well, I'm 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 familiar with how the solar system moves through the universe, and it's fascinating to watch. It's an amazing, amazing thing to see. Okay, well, here's the deal. Supposedly, according to this one philosophy that I've heard, 
we're coming into a great enlightenment. There's going to be a great enlightenment, and we're we're accessing it now as we process go go through the upswing through the galactic elliptic. And I didn't know if you'd heard that before. I've heard that before. People like, yeah, yeah, I've heard yeah. a version of that. Okay, sure. people like you are a major part of this, both of you. And all I'm saying, and that's what I wanted to talk about, do you agree that this is really happening? Because I'm sitting here listening on the Internet. You know, I've been through hell in my life. You would not believe the contract I made. <laughs> so anyway, Congratulations. Kudos to you. Well, anyway, I've come out on the other side relatively philosophical about it. I still hate my half-brother, but I, I'm getting, I forgive him. <laughs> but every, I'm, every now and then, I had to go to the council and say he has gone too far. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this. I've been talking to them. So, and, well, that's great. And, uh, I think that's fantastic. I think you're on the right path. Listen, I, I agree with you, and I've seen it myself. We're having this conversation, and you have to ask, how can it be that we're having this conversation? Well, a number of things had to happen. The Internet had to happen. And that's like a democratic way of sharing ideas with like-minded people. That was that didn't exist in you know until the twenty thirty years ago, and now we can in real time. We're the three of us are conversing from three different parts of the planet. We're sharing thoughts and emotions and feelings. People never could do this before, and it must alter us in some way, and it may be more profound on the planet. I just I think it's important to note that we're in charge of that that shift in consciousness and not someone else. It's not just because we're traveling through that, that part of the world. It's also because it's time. I've heard that consistently from guides on the other side, like, eh, it's time. <laughs> you know. Well, I think the phrase shift in consciousness, uh, when people hear that, I think their eyes glaze over just a little right. bit and they're going, gosh, what does that really mean? Is this some new age crystal stuff or what? I think, Shift in consciousness also means, very simply, an increase in knowledge. Um, I think that has a big part, a big part of it. The more yeah, we right. can learn about the soul and the spirit and how these journeys take place and the, the trip to there and all the way back and understanding, you know, the, the accidental, intentional nature of life, it's kind of intentional and accidental at the same time. And then there's synchronicity that comes into play, understanding how all these things come together and meet and interact Right. That is a shift in consciousness. So I don't necessarily think a shift in consciousness is some great magical thing that some guy in the sky with a beard is going to wave a wand and now we're all beings of light. But I think the more we understand <laughs> this life, I think that is also how we shift in consciousness. So to answer the caller's question, yes, I do believe this is happening, but I don't necessarily think that it's uh, brought down by extraterrestrials or or um, that it's some magical thing that only happens to a few people, I think. Well, I, I love that guide's explanation where he said, you know, it's no big deal in terms of the cosmos. However, if you want to imagine what a shift in consciousness, imagine yourself a little tiny crab walking on the ocean floor, which is a funny Pixar image, you know. Right. And then blink, yeah. your eyes open up, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm in an ocean, you know. <laughs> I didn't know I was in an ocean. I thought I was walking on, you know. And so that's... He, that's his point. That's a shift in consciousness, and that's okay to have. Mm. You know, what a great conversation tonight this is. All right. Well, the phone is full. Richard Martini is here. And what more can I possibly ask for? Let's take another break. And when we come back, your calls with Richard Martini and myself. I'm Heather Wade. Well, I just want to say something to the caller before the break, if I might. Take a moment here. Uh, sir, I would love to hear from you on a Friday night at Open Lines, if you can, and if you can make it in and give me a call. 
just some of the things that you said make me want to talk to you some more. You said you've been there, that you've talked with the council and, and all of this. So I would love to talk to you on a Friday night open lines uh, where we've got plenty of time to do that. So uh, thank you for the call. I hope you're out there and I hope that I hear from you again on a Friday night open lines. So uh, let's get to more. Uh, Richard, welcome back to the program. I'm having a hell of a time tonight. This is great. <laughs> so uh, let's jump back in. Uh, I do have some questions in the wormhole that I want to get to, but I want to keep. I don't want to keep people on the line waiting. So uh, here we go. Sure. You're on the air with Richard Martini, and welcome to the program. Hello? No, I didn't do it. <laughs> hey, this is Roy. <laughs> uh, you were going to, weren't you? <laughs> I just had to give you some, you know, stuff. <laughs> anyway, my, my main my main question is, is, I've been I've been clinically dead five times, and my wow. longest time was not was nine and a half minutes. Wow. And my, it, and my, have you ever heard of walk-ins? I have, and um, I have an opinion about it. Because, because I have this feeling that every time I've, I've come back, I'm somebody else. And people will say like, like the last time was in 2000 during my cancer surgery. Uh-huh. And you know, cancer, I mean, cancer changes everybody, obviously. Sure. So people that knew me, that knew me for years just said like, I, "I I'm like a totally different person. Like my my sense of humor is different. The way I act Are is different." Are you funnier? <laughs> funnier or less funny? It sounds um, like you're funnier. I'm, like a, I'm more like a gallows kind of humor. <laughs> we like that. That's very good. Well, let me let you me know, just it, feel, let me let me just re, you know respond to you in terms of the research. Michael Newton uh, came across this quite a bit. Uh, it was his contention over his 7,000 cases because, you know, while he's in there talking to someone who had this feeling or experience that they might be subject to that, like a walk-in, somehow their spirit left. or it, He never had a case that he wasn't able to ask the higher self the journey of how this came to be, why the difference was. So it, he was against calling them walk-ins because he his whole uh position was one soul one body now in my research there was one case and i mentioned it in flip side where a guy said that for the first four years of his life he was one person and then some and agree and his spirit guide had taken his place because he was busy living another life and then at the age of four he switched now that's the only case that I was able to examine and talk to the guy about. But even in that case, it was an agreement done with the spirit guide and the higher self. Do you see what I'm saying? So the idea is if you feel differently, and people, by the way, when they have an out-of-body experience, often when they come back, they feel differently. And you must allow that while you're outside your body, you may be learning things and seeing things and experiencing things. And, of course, imagine the journey you've taken, not consciously, but unconsciously. So when you come back, you're going to be a different person because you've experienced all these things. Your persona might change. I just had this conversation with a friend the other day who she said when she was like 18 or 19 years old, you know, she she was a walk-in, that her her bad self had left and her good self appeared. And my, my point is only you can examine this stuff under under hypnosis. You can examine this stuff with a therapist who can ask your higher self why you had that experience. Does that make sense? Well, let's bring him on back. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Pardon? Kind of? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that kind of – but then that raises the question, well – what am I spirit guy? Do I change? Would I ever change my higher self? Like if I made it, like could I, could I have made an agreement with another spirit to say, "Hey, I've had enough of planet Earth. I don't like it. It sucks. Maybe you'll have better luck. Welcome <laughs> to my body." <laughs> well, I can tell yeah, you I, there was one, there was one other case where uh, Scott DeTamble was interviewing somebody. I've had it on film, and it's in it's a wonderful afterlife where she said that in a previous lifetime, her boyfriend had come to her and said, I need your help because I have accidentally broke the neck of my wife and you need to step in and live out her life because she doesn't want to come back. Now imagine 
the construct. This is in the between lies realm. Her her constant companion shows up and says, I need you to do this emergency step in. And Scott, who has had much experience with this and hundreds and hundreds of cases, had never run across anything like it. So he said, oh, wait, wait a second. Let's talk to the woman who died. And so we did. We. I mean, he asked questions to this woman who said, no, no, he didn't accidentally kill me. He actually killed me, and I don't want anything to do with him anymore. And I'm not coming back to that body. But this girl, who had had many lifetimes with this guy, claims that she stepped in with this broken neck and somehow was able to heal it, wear a brace, and come back and live out the life. So, I, you know, all I can say is it's so rare as to be really unusually rare but the only answer is that you need to talk to your guides and say, did this happen? Is this happening? And they're going to let you know. They'll tell you. Right. Well, and if it's only a third of us that's here, right? right. And then when we Roughly. go to that other, right, approximately, we go to that other place and then, and then we come back as he's done five different times. I wonder yeah. if different aspects, a different third comes back. Oh, that's interesting. No, I never thought of that. But of course, that would make sense. Let's say that a, a third of you goes back and, and now you're like, well, you're not really learning the lessons that you, were, you signed up to learn. And you're like, well, OK, so how do I change that? And they say, well, you know, add a little more anger in there, you know, put a little more sarcasm in there. And maybe you come back with, with some more of your energy. I love that. That's a great answer. <laughs> I think well, you intuitively answered that. That's a possibility. You know, I don't know. I, I know it's probably bad form for a host to jump in and try to answer questions. I can't break no, that no, habit. No, no, I love it. Listen, you just spoke <laughs> to your higher guides. There's no, there's no reason we can't ask them. You know, you see, we can go right back to Mrs. Chen, Miss Chen. Right. You know, yes. and, and we can ask them, but we don't have to. But I'm just saying, you know, you always can. Well, and They're... what an interesting question. Right. And the questions have been really kind of interesting so far. So, you know, I I would say follow Richard's advice. And if you can go into a meditation uh, and, and not uh, don't don't fall prey, fall victim, rather, to uh, the baggage associated with that word meditation. And well, just a, a go good in. hypnotherapist will help, you know, okay. a, a, a Newton-trained hypnotherapist who's very familiar with this. You see, that's why I recommend them, because if you go with somebody who's never had an experience in a between lives realm, it could be difficult for them to understand what's happening. But if you go with somebody like a tour guide who's been there many, many, many times, they can look around and say, well, let's talk to so-and-so. Let's ask this question. And if you go to the Newton Institute, you can search for a Newton-trained hypnotherapist in every country in the world roughly, and find one near you. So I highly recommend looking into them, interviewing them, find the right person for you. It doesn't have to be them, but, you know, make sure before you go in, you're, you know what you're going to access. And then that way you can really do it with a guide, with somebody who can help guide you the way I helped guide you. Mm -hmm. You right. see? No, you know? Exactly right. Yes. I would love to see this man get his answers. And my God, sir, you've also got to call me on a Friday night open lines, because if you're willing to talk about it, I want to hear about your near-death experiences. It's a fascinating topic. Fascinating. Uh, let me see here now. On line two, you're on the air. You've been patiently waiting. Now you're on the air with Richard Martini. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's Colby from Wisconsin. Well, hi, Colby. Hi, Colby. I, I think the in-between times are rather interesting. Um, I turned the show on tonight and fell asleep, and as I was, I kind of, kind of got when I woke up, kind of got caught in between waking and sleeping. Was struggling to <laughs> figure out what you were talking to, uh, talking about. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this would be a bad night for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I got a I got a, a thought in my head that um, when my previous lifetime ended, my first words were, um, "Oops." <laughs> <laughs> funny. That's very funny. And, you know, maybe that's I think, true. I think, I think in the previous lifetime, I might have missed the point. <laughs> oh, no. Well, uh, did you have a question for Richard for tonight? Um, well, I don't know. I'm kind of curious, curious about my relationship with my daughter. It seems like we're, I like get this feeling that 
she was originally supposed to be with somebody else, and then at the last moment, changed things got changed, and she was born How to me. How old is she? How old is she? She's nineteen now. Nineteen. Okay. I, listen, I would recommend taking a look at Carol Bowman's book, Children's Past Lives. She talks about cases that she's examined in great detail where people have examined that um, that phenomenon where somebody would say, you know, Mom, I was supposed to be born to Aunt Betty, but she lost me, and so I came to you instead. And then, you know, they went to Aunt Betty and found out that she'd had a miscarriage or, you know, something else. But in it, that's a feeling you might have had that, you know, um, but she did find her way to you, and that's a wonderful thing. And so the only thing you can do is kind of allow that unconditional love to sort of, you know, be part of the journey, which is no matter how difficult she might be. Or, you know, even if she's the one saying, you're not my real mom, <laughs> you know, my real mom is somebody else, whatever that is. Eventually, we all get back home and we all see why we made the choices we made. And we all see the unconditional love that we got from those around us. So what a treat that you guys were able to find each other here well, yes. in Wisconsin. Yeah, actually, places. yes. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that does relate. Uh, really good timing, Colby, for asking your question, because I have a question in the wormhole fairly similar. This comes in from Linda in Ontario, and she says, well, I'm fascinated listening to all this tonight. How often or has Richard seen where two or more people are part of the same soul group, and can we incarnate together? Well, I'll tell you, the most fascinating one was really one of the first cases. I was, I met this uh, professor in London, Robert Beer, and he's a very interesting guy. And but when I shook his hand, I had this feeling like, this is why you're in London to meet the guy. I, and I've never had that feeling before. But you know, we stayed in touch over the years. Um, about six months later, he wrote to me and said his daughter had died suddenly. Oh, I felt terrible, but I had been reading Carol Bowman's book. Uh, children's past lives so i sent him a copy of it and he wrote to me back and said are you familiar with michael newton's work and i wasn't so he introduced me to michael newton and so what happened was he said he was going to go into a session and see if he could contact his daughter in a between life session frequently you can access people that you know and love and he did and he said, listen, I know what it's like to be with my daughter. And I spent an hour holding her hand, talking to her. And she explained to me and showed me the many lifetimes we've had together. He said it was very profound. But he also saw a previous lifetime that he had with a woman that he knows from this life, a woman that he used to date. She lives in Boston. Now, this is a guy who's never been to Boston, but this girl that he met in the 60s and they dated for a while. She, you know, got married and moved off to Boston. But in his past life memory, that's who he was married to back in 1840 when he was a banker in Boston. Okay, he wrote this all to me, and I said to him, are you friends with her? He said, yeah. And I said, well, can we try an experiment? So what I did was I arranged for a hypnotherapist in New York to see her. She knew nothing about his session. And she went into this hypnotherapist in New York City and had the identical memory oh. of being married to him back in 1840 in Boston. Wow. So, yes, people do sometimes find each other <laughs> and in hypnotherapy realize they've been together many lifetimes. They'll see their loved one in many different, you know, shapes and forms and, and connections. And they realized, I mean, uh, there's a case in uh, Flipside where there were these two Mormons that came, you know, they were, read about this stuff and they thought it was interesting to check it out. And in their um, their sessions, they both had a session, they both saw that they had had many lifetimes together in different religions, you know, <laughs> nuns and priests and whatever, and that all the people in their ward were people that they normally incarnated with. And so even though everything they learned was contrary to what they were being taught, they still were connected to all these people. And the same therapist also told me this amazing story of um, of how a guy had come in to see her, also Mormon, and he had been outed by his ward because he was gay. And so they had ostracized him and shunned him, and he lost his job and his family, and he was furious. 
And he went to see this hypnotherapist. And while he was doing the session, he saw that the guy who outed him, the bishop, was somebody he knew for many lifetimes. And that guy said to him, don't you remember? This was our agreement. I would out you so you could experience real love because you never had it. We've always been like in some priest thing together. So now this is what you wanted. And so in that moment, he was able to forgive everybody, his family, his friends, et cetera, et cetera, which is a roundabout way of saying, yes, people do find their soulmates in these sessions. Not always. And I must say, sometimes people agree to be on the planet apart so that they can learn from other people. Mm Mm-hmm. I would imagine so. I mean, I'd imagine that in the place between lives, the the agreements that we make are probably endless. There's probably an infinite number of different agreements you could possibly make in this life. Uh, And and some of those we would probably think are just absolutely crazy. But you have access (laughs) to so much knowledge there that, uh, you know, and, and I guess you have an opportunity to look through with your counsel and say, well, I've had all these experiences is what haven't I done yet? And then that thing that you haven't done yet, well, that's going to be the thing that you land on. And to most of us, it may sound insane, like being a Holocaust victim. But I guess when you're fully yourself, when you're not a third of yourself, and you're a whole 100% of yourself, you've got, uh, you're looking at life, you're looking at earth, you're looking at this whole thing with very, very different eyes. Uh, Over on the international line, you're on the air with Rich Martini. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Uh, Well, hello, hello. The sirens going in the background. Um, Yeah, so I've got a very quick statement, Um, and this is soon going to go straight past. Uh, Those are the sirens of London right there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, um, I, I was um, just wondering, I've got a very quick uh, statement and then a kind of a question, um, that sure. if time is um, not linear to, uh, in the afterlife, then I kind of believe that we never really truly leave the other side, and most, and like, you know, the whole of us is still kind of connected with the the afterlife but um you can come back to that if you like but the the, the main kind of important question is that i was told by um a, a really good um astrologer that i've been through the the kind of 12 cycles of um lifetimes and that if i chose to um i could choose kind of not to to come back uh or go through the 12 cycles again and i was just wondering what the kind of my purpose would be after if i chose that path like um would it be to be a spirit guide or just wondering well that's a a great question and great question and let me give you an example and it relates to um what you were just saying heather about being back on the flip side and saying well what what haven't i experienced yet Uh, a guide showed me um a metaphor he said think of a lifetime as a blank canvas and with your guide you and the guide sort of work out all the colors that are going to be on the canvas. And when you put up all that color, eventually, at the end of all those lifetimes, you have this magnificent three-dimensional portrait of a soul. And you may say, oh, I'm missing some red over here. I need some more purple over there. or I need some more over here. And eventually, you keep going through those lifetimes. And then I asked him, so so how did how did you become a guide? And he said, well, after all of my lifetimes, I graduated. Now, the, you know, astrologers will tell you there's 12 cycles because there's 12 different things of the, of the you know, zodiac. But, eh, you know, you could have hundreds of lifetimes. It, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. But at the end of those hundreds of lifetimes, as he put it, he said, my, I graduated. And my graduation gift was Richard, was me. So like a a soul was handed to him and he said, and now Richard, it's your choice. But after all the lifetimes that you're going to lead, you may choose to be a guide. And then a soul will be turned over to you as your graduation gift. Now, souls weren't all created at the Big Bang. They come in at any time. They can always be created because as he talked about time a little bit. There's a misconception in New Age literature. I'm, I call it misconception where people talk about everything happens simultaneously. You, you've heard that before. Yeah. There is no time. Well, that doesn't allow for 
education or learning because if you everything's happening simultaneously, you can't learn any lessons because they're all happening at the same time. But we do have young souls and we do have older souls. So one guy explained it to me. He said, think of a string. You know, it goes left to right. But when you look down the the barrel of the string, you can see it in three dimensions and you can see all the things along it. So you can, like he was saying, one foot in, one foot out, you can experience and see all of your lifetimes as like this big, huge puzzle or painting, right? They're mm-hmm. linear, but they've all happened, you know, within a pretty quick, you know, like I said, it was the time is relative, a quick succession of events. I've asked this question many times. What's it like to you people over there? And they'll say, everything's happening so quickly. I can fly anywhere. I can move quickly. One person that I was interviewing uh, two months later showed up, and I said to him, now, look, I asked you questions two months ago. What's it feel like for you, for me to be asking you a question today? He said, like a continuous sentence, like two months were a comma. (laughs) <laughs> That's the feeling for him. So was that linear? Yes. What did it did it seem like it happened simultaneously? Yes, that as well. So there is this concomitance, which is two things existing at the same time, where you can experience two thirds of us is back there in that, you know, no time realm, relatively no time realm. And while one third of us is down here on stage slaving through, you know, putting on props, finding broken swords, whatever it is we're doing, you know, trying to remember our lines, hoping our friends remember their lines, <laughs> watching our friends jump off of stage and run screaming out of the theater. Hey, where are you going? Come on. You're supposed to be here for the third act. You know, we do have that experience of being here on stage, but we also have the experience of watching ourselves on stage. So it's a weird, you know, how marionettes work, you know, the puppeteer is back there and the strings affect the person on stage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the puppet on stage, it's experiencing the world as it experiences it, not realizing that its higher self is up there pulling those strings. You know, take out the sword. Now you missed her. You know, strike again. Whatever that is. It's a long way of saying, yeah, it's a huge, magnificent puzzle, but it's a puzzle of our own design. And if you were to take any puzzle piece out, then the picture isn't complete. And even if that's a painful puzzle piece or uh, a regrettable puzzle piece, it still has its place in the picture. Correct. And you may, once you take that puzzle piece out and then you get back home and then you go, well, I'm done. I've done all my lifetimes. And somebody goes, ah, you're missing this puzzle piece. And you go, I don't care about that. I'm done. And they go, yeah, okay. But, you know, you really need to learn that lesson. And you may you may relax and say, I don't want to learn it now. But eventually, 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 and I've heard this many times, you're going to eventually come back and learn the lesson that you avoided before. Hmm. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank God. Because it makes <laughs> us... A hundred percent where we may get here and just be about 15 percent or so. I don't know. I'm not that good at math. But this has been so much fun tonight. We've got to what do this treat, again. Heather. Yeah, so I really fun. had a fun time, especially the uh, spontaneous uh, session that we had in yeah, the middle of the show. That's called. I don't know. There's no word for it. I haven't thought. Somebody told me I should charge people and do it, you know, for a living. And I was like, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> It's just fun. (laughs) Well, I just wonder how many other hosts have done a thing like that on the air, live on the air. Don't even just walk right into it. I had no idea. I'm telling you guys, that was nowhere on my notes for tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for doing it and for being open to it and allowing yourself to just see and experience whatever it was that came in front of you. Because I think all of us had a real treat to hear and experience what that was like talking to those people. Well, like I said, it's one thing to talk about it. It's quite another to to actually just go in and do it. Uh, So if people want to keep up with you, you've got your website, richmartini.com. Also, uh, you've got uh, the flip side, right? That's your movie. And you've also got Hacking the Afterlife. It's a wonderful afterlife. Uh, How many books do you have? Four. So there's two. It's a Wonderful Afterlife, Volume 1 and 2. 
And then flip side is a book, which is the transcripts from the movie. So there's a book and a movie, and then Hacking the Afterlife, which will soon be a movie as soon as I can get around to it. Oh, I sure <laughs> hope so. And hey, you got a program here to come on uh, to talk all about oh, Hacking so the cool. Afterlife once it's released, or even right before it's released. Uh, right. But I know That'd we got to do this again, Rich. We absolutely have to. I had a fantastic time. Thank you, Heather. All right. Well, that is Rich Martini. Everybody-